The Dark Cosmos Presents, The War of the Worlds, Book One, The Coming of the Martians, written by Herbert George Wells. This classic alien invasion tale was first published in 1897. Sit back, relax, and unwind for the next few hours with this classic sci-fi story that features a quiet town in England that becomes the landing spot for eerie visitors from Mars. Are you ready? Let's begin. Book One, The Coming of the Martians. Chapter One, The Eve of the War. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infusoria under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older worlds of space as sources of human danger, or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible or improbable. It is curious to recall some of the mental habits of those departed days. At most, terrestrial men fancied there might be other men upon Mars, perhaps inferior to themselves, and ready to welcome a missionary enterprise. Yet across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds, as ours are to those of the beasts that perish, intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. And early in the twentieth century, came the great disillusionment. The planet Mars, I scarcely need remind the reader, revolves about the Sun at a mean distance of 140 million miles, and the light and heat it receives from the Sun is barely half of that received by this world. It must be, if the nebula hypothesis has any truth, older than our world. And long before this Earth ceased to be molten, life upon its surface must have begun its course. The fact that it is scarcely one-seventh of the volume of the Earth must have accelerated its cooling to the temperature at which life could begin. It has air and water and all that is necessary for the support of animated existence. Yet so vain is man and so blinded by his vanity that no writer up to the very end of the 19th century expressed any idea that intelligent life might have developed there far, or indeed at all, beyond its earthly level. Nor was it generally understood that since Mars is older than our Earth, with scarcely a quarter of the superficial area and remoter from the Sun, it necessarily follows that it is not only more distant from time's beginning, but nearer its end. The secular cooling that must someday overtake our planet has already gone far indeed with our neighbor. Its physical condition is still largely a mystery, but we know now that even in its equatorial region the midday temperature barely approaches that of our coldest winter. Its air is much more attenuated than ours, its oceans have shrunk until they cover but a third of its surface. And as its slow seasons change, huge snowcaps gather and melt about either pole and periodically inundate its temperate zones. That last stage of exhaustion, which to us is still incredibly remote, has become a present-day problem for the inhabitants of Mars. The immediate pressure of necessity has brightened their intellects, enlarged their powers, and hardened their hearts and looking across space with instruments and intelligences such as we have scarcely dreamed of, they see, at its nearest distance, only 35 million of miles sunward of them. A morning star of hope, our own warmer planet, green with vegetation and grey with water, with a cloudy atmosphere, eloquent of fertility, with glimpses through its drifting cloud, wisps of broad stretches of populous country and narrow, navy-crowded seas. And we men, the creatures who inhabit this earth, must be to them at least as alien and lowly as are the monkeys and lemurs to us. The intellectual side of man already admits that life is an incessant struggle for existence, and it would seem that this too is the belief of the minds upon Mars. 
Their world is far gone in its cooling, and this world is still crowded with life, but crowded only with what they regard as inferior animals. To carry warfare, Sunward is indeed their only escape from the destruction that, generation after generation, creeps upon them. And before we judge of them too harshly, we must remember what ruthless and utter destruction our own species has wrought, not only upon animals such as the vanished bison and the dodo, but upon its inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the space of fifty years. Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? The Martians seem to have calculated their descent with amazing subtlety. Their mathematical learning is evidently far in excess of ours, and to have carried out their preparations with a well-nigh perfect unanimity. Had our instruments permitted it, we might have seen the gathering trouble far back in the 19th century. Men like Schiaparelli watched the Red Planet, it is odd, by the by, that for countless centuries Mars has been the star of war, but failed to interpret the fluctuating appearances of the markings they mapped so well. All that time, the Martians must have been getting ready. During the opposition of 1894, a great light was seen on the illuminated part of the disk, first at the Lick Observatory, then by Perotin of Nice, and then by other observers. English readers heard of it first in the issue of the Nature that dated August 2nd. I am inclined to think that this blaze may have been the casting of the huge gun in the vast pit sunk into their planet from which their shots were fired at us. Peculiar markings, as yet unexplained, were seen near the site of that outbreak during the next two oppositions. The storm burst upon us six years ago now. As Mars approached opposition, Lavelle of Java set the wires of the astronomical exchange palpitating with the amazing intelligence of a huge outbreak of incandescent gas upon the planet. It had occurred towards midnight of the 12th, and the spectroscope, to which he had at once resorted, indicated a mass of flaming gas, chiefly hydrogen, moving with an enormous velocity towards this Earth. This jet of fire had become invisible about a quarter past twelve. He compared it to a colossal puff of flame suddenly and violently squirted out of the planet as flaming gases rushed out of a gun. A singularly appropriate phrase it proved. Yet the next day there was nothing of this in the papers except a little note in the Daily Telegraph and the world went in ignorance of one of the gravest dangers that ever threatened the human race. I might not have heard of the eruption at all had I not met Ogilvy, the well-known astronomer at Ottershaw. He was immensely excited at the news, and in the excess of his feelings invited me up to take a turn with him that night in a scrutiny of the Red Planet. In spite of all that has happened since, I still remember that vigil very distinctly. The black and silent observatory, the shadowed lantern throwing a feeble glow upon the floor in the corner, the steady ticking of the clockwork of the telescope, the little slit in the roof, an oblong profundity with the stardust streaked across it. Ogilvy moved about, invisible but audible. Looking through the telescope, one saw a circle of deep blue and the little round planet swimming in the field. It seemed such a little thing, so bright and small and still, faintly marked with transverse stripes and slightly flattened from the perfect round. But so little it was, so silvery warm, a pin's head of light. It was as if it quivered, but really this was the telescope vibrating with the activity of the clockwork that kept the planet in view. As I watched, the planet seemed to grow larger and smaller and to advance and recede, but that was simply that my eye was tired. Forty millions of miles it was from us, more than forty millions of miles of void. Few people realize the immensity of vacancy in which the dust of the material universe swims. Near it, in the field, I remember, were three faint points of light, three telescopic stars infinitely remote, and all around it was the unfathomable darkness of empty space. You know how that blackness looks on a frosty starlight night. In a telescope, it seems far profounder and invisible to me because it was so remote and small, 
flying swiftly and steadily towards me across that incredible distance, drawing nearer every minute by so many thousands of miles, came the thing they were sending us, the thing that was to bring so much struggle and calamity and death to the earth. I never dreamed of it then as I watched. No one on earth dreamed of that unerring missile. That night, too, there was another jetting out of gas from the distant planet. I saw it, a reddish flash at the edge, the slightest projection of the outline just as the chronometer struck midnight. And at that, I told Ogilvy, and he took my place. The night was warm, and I was thirsty, and I went stretching my legs clumsily and feeling my way in the darkness to the little table where the siphon stood, while Ogilvy exclaimed at the streamer of gas that came out towards us. That night, another invisible missile started on its way to the Earth from Mars, just a second or so under 24 hours after the first one. I remember how I sat on the table there in the blackness, with patches of green and crimson swimming before my eyes. I wished I had a light to smoke by, little suspecting the meaning of the minute gleam I had seen and all that it would presently bring me. Ogilvy watched till one and then gave it up, and we lit the lantern and walked over to his house. Down below in the darkness were Ottershaw and Chertsey and all their hundreds of people sleeping in peace. He was full of speculation that night about the condition of Mars and scoffed at the vulgar idea of its having inhabitants who were signalling us. His idea was that meteorites might be falling in a heavy shower upon the planet or that a huge volcanic explosion was in progress. He pointed out to me how unlikely it was that organic evolution had taken the same direction in the two adjacent planets. The chances against anything manlike on Mars are a million to one, he said. Hundreds of observers saw the flame that night and the night after about midnight and again the night after. And so for ten nights, a flame each night. Why the shots ceased after the tenth, no one on Earth has attempted to explain. It may be the gases of the firing caused the Martians inconvenience. Dense clouds of smoke or dust, visible through a powerful telescope on Earth, as little grey, fluctuating patches spread through the clearness of the planet's atmosphere and obscured its more familiar features. Even the daily papers woke up to the disturbances at last, and popular notes appeared here, there, and everywhere concerning the volcanoes upon Mars. The serio-comic periodical Punch, I remember, made a happy use of it in the political cartoon, and, all unsuspected, those missiles the Martians had fired at us drew earthward, rushing now at a pace of many miles a second through the empty gulf of space, hour by hour and day by day, nearer and nearer. It seems to me now almost incredibly wonderful that, with that swift fate hanging over us, men could go about their petty concerns as they did. I remember how jubilant Markham was at securing a new photograph of the planet for the illustrated paper he edited in those days. People in these latter times scarcely realized the abundance and enterprise of our 19th century papers. For my own part, I was much occupied in learning to ride the bicycle and busy upon a series of papers discussing the probable developments of moral ideas as civilization progressed. One night, the first missile then could scarcely have been ten million miles away, I went for a walk with my wife. It was starlight, and I explained the signs of the zodiac to her and pointed out Mars, a bright dot of light creeping zenithward, towards which so many telescopes were pointed. It was a warm night. Coming home, a party of excursionists from Chertsey or Isleworth passed us singing and playing music. There were lights in the upper windows of the houses as the people went to bed. From the railway station in the distance came the sound of shunting trains, ringing and rumbling, softened almost into melody by the distance. My wife pointed out to me the brightness of the red, green and yellow signal lights hanging in a framework against the sky. It seemed so safe and tranquil. Chapter 2 The Falling Star then came the night of the first falling star. It was seen early in the morning, rushing over Winchester eastward, a line of flame high in the atmosphere. 
Hundreds must have seen it and taken it for an ordinary falling star. Albin described it as leaving a greenish streak behind it that glowed for some seconds. Denning, our greatest authority on meteorites, stated that the height of its first appearance was about 90 or 100 miles. It seemed to him that it fell to Earth about 100 miles east of him. I was at home at that hour and writing in my study, and although my French windows faced towards Ottershaw and the blind was up, for I loved in those days to look up at the night sky, I saw nothing of it. Yet this strangest of all things that ever came to Earth from outer space must have fallen while I was sitting there, visible to me had I only looked up as it passed. Some of those who saw its flight say it travelled with a hissing sound. I myself heard nothing of that. Many people in Berkshire, Surrey and Middlesex must have seen the fall of it, and at most have thought that another meteorite had descended. No one seems to have troubled to look for the fallen mass that night. But very early in the morning, poor Ogilvy, who had seen the shooting star, and who was persuaded that a meteorite lay somewhere on the common between Horsell, Ottershaw and Woking, rose early with the idea of finding it. Find it he did, soon after dawn, and not far from the sand pits. An enormous hole had been made by the impact of the projectile, and the sand and gravel had been flung violently in every direction over the heath, forming heaps visible a mile and a half away. The heather was on fire eastward, and a thin blue smoke rose against the dawn. The thing itself lay almost entirely buried in sand, amidst the scattered splinters of a fir tree it had shivered to fragments in its descent. The uncovered part had the appearance of a huge cylinder, caked over and its outline softened by a thick, scaly, dun-coloured incrustation. It had a diameter of about thirty yards. He approached the mass, surprised at the size and more so at the shape, since most meteorites are rounded more or less completely. It was, however, still so hot from its flight through the air as to forbid his near approach. A stirring noise within its cylinder he ascribed to the unequal cooling of its surface, for at that time it had not occurred to him that it might be hollow. He remained standing at the edge of the pit that the thing had made for itself, staring at its strange appearance, astonished chiefly at its unusual shape and colour, and dimly perceiving even then some evidence of design in its arrival. The early morning was wonderfully still, and the sun, just clearing the pine trees towards Weybridge, was already warm. He did not remember hearing any birds that morning, there was certainly no breeze stirring, and the only sounds were the faint movements from within the cindery cylinder. He was all alone on the common. Then suddenly he noticed with a start that some of the grey clinker, the ashy incrustation that covered the meteorite, was falling off the circular edge of the end. It was dropping off in flakes and raining down upon the sand. A large piece suddenly came off and fell with a sharp noise that brought his heart into his mouth. For a minute, he scarcely realized what this meant, and although the heat was excessive, he clambered down into the pit close to the bulk to see the thing more clearly. He fancied even then that the cooling of the body might account for this, but what disturbed that idea was the fact that the ash was falling only from the end of the cylinder. And then he perceived that, very slowly, the circular top of the cylinder was rotating on its body. It was such a gradual movement that he discovered it only through noticing that a black mark that had been near him five minutes ago was now at the other side of the circumference. Even then, he scarcely understood what this indicated, until he heard a muffled grating sound and saw the black mark jerk forward an inch or so. Then the thing came upon him in a flash. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out, Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens, said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash upon Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. At that, he stood irresolute for a moment, then turned, scrambled out of the pit, 
and set off running wildly into Woking. The time, then, must have been somewhere about six o'clock. He met a wagoner and tried to make him understand, but the tale he told and his appearance were so wild, his hat had fallen off in the pit, that the man simply drove on. He was equally unsuccessful with the potman who was just unlocking the doors of the public house by Horsell Bridge. The fellow thought he was a lunatic at large and made an unsuccessful attempt to shut him into the taproom. That sobered him a little, and when he saw Henderson, the London journalist, in his garden, he called over the palings and made himself understood. Henderson, he called. You saw that shooting star last night. Well, said Henderson, it's out on Horsell Common now. Good Lord, said Henderson. Fallen meteorite. That's good. But it's something more than a meteorite. It's a cylinder. An artificial cylinder, man. And there's something inside. Henderson stood up with his spade in his hand. What's that? he said. He was deaf in one ear. Ogilvy told him all that he had seen. Henderson was a minute or so taking it in. Then he dropped his spade, snatched up his jacket, and came out into the road. The two men hurried back at once to the common, and found the cylinder still lying in the same position. But now the sounds inside had ceased, and a thin circle of bright metal showed between the top and the body of the cylinder. Air was either entering or escaping at the rim with a thin, sizzling sound. They listened, wrapped on the scaly burnt metal with a stick, and meeting with no response, they both concluded the man or men inside must be insensible or dead. Of course the two were quite unable to do anything. They shouted consolation and promises, and went off back to the town again to get help. One can imagine them, covered with sand, excited and disordered, running up the little street in the bright sunlight, just as the shop folks were taking down their shutters and people were opening their bedroom windows. Henderson went into the railway station at once in order to telegraph the news to London. The newspaper articles had prepared men's minds for the reception of the idea. By eight o'clock, a number of boys and unemployed men had already started for the common to see the dead men from Mars. That was the form the story took. I heard of it first from my newspaper boy about a quarter to nine when I went out to get my daily chronicle. I was naturally startled and lost no time in going out and across the Ottershaw Bridge to the sand pits. Chapter 3 On Horsell Common I found a little crowd of perhaps twenty people surrounding the huge hole in which the cylinder lay. I have already described the appearance of that colossal bulk embedded in the ground. The turf and gravel about it seemed charred as if by a sudden explosion. No doubt its impact had caused a flash of fire. Henderson and Ogilvy were not there. I think they perceived that nothing was to be done for the present, and had gone away to breakfast at Henderson's house. There were four or five boys sitting on the edge of the pit, with their feet dangling and amusing themselves, until I stopped them by throwing stones at the giant mass. After I had spoken to them about it, they began playing at touch, in and out of the group of bystanders. Among these were a couple of cyclists, a jobbing gardener I employed sometimes, a girl carrying a baby, Greg the butcher and his little boy, and two or three loafers and golf caddies who were accustomed to hang about the railway station. There was very little talking. Few of the common people in England had anything but the vaguest astronomical ideas in those days. Most of them were staring quietly at the big table like end of the cylinder, which was still as Ogilvy and Henderson had left it. I fancy the popular expectation of a heap of charred corpses was disappointed at this inanimate bulk. Some went away while I was there, and other people came. I clambered into the pit and fancied I heard a faint movement under my feet. The top had certainly ceased to rotate. It was only when I got thus close to it that the strangeness of this object was at all evident to me. At the first glance, it was really no more exciting than an overturned carriage or a tree blown across the road. Not so much so, indeed. It looked like a rusty gas float. It required a certain amount of scientific education to perceive that the grey scale of the thing was no common oxide, that the yellowish-white metal that gleamed in the crack between the lid and the cylinder had an unfamiliar hue. 
extraterrestrial had no meaning for most of the onlookers. At that time, it was quite clear in my own mind that the thing had come from the planet Mars, but I judged it improbable that it contained any living creature. I thought the unscrewing might be automatic. In spite of Ogilvy, I still believed that there were men in Mars. My mind ran fancifully on the possibilities of its containing manuscript, on the difficulties in translation that might arise, whether we should find coins and models in it, and so forth. Yet it was a little too large for assurance on this idea. I felt an impatience to see it opened. About eleven, as nothing seemed happening, I walked back, full of such thought, to my home in Maybury. But I found it difficult to get to work upon my abstract investigations. In the afternoon, the appearance of the common had altered very much. The early editions of the evening papers had startled London with enormous headlines. A message received from Mars. Remarkable story from Woking, and so forth. In addition, Ogilvy's wire to the Astronomical Exchange had roused every observatory in the Three Kingdoms. There were half a dozen flies or more from the Woking station standing in the road by the sand pits, a basket chaise from Chobham, and a rather lordly carriage. Besides that, there was quite a heap of bicycles. In addition, a large number of people must have walked, in spite of the heat of the day, from Woking and Chertsey, so that there was altogether quite a considerable crowd, one or two gaily dressed ladies among the others. It was glaringly hot, not a cloud in the sky, nor a breath of wind, and the only shadow was that of the few scattered pine trees. The burning heather had been extinguished, but the level ground towards Ottershaw was blackened as far as one could see, and still giving off vertical streamers of smoke. An enterprising sweetstuff dealer in the Chobham Road had sent up his son with a barrow load of green apples and ginger beer. Going to the edge of the pit, I found it occupied by a group of about half a dozen men, Henderson, Ogilvy, and a tall, fair-haired man that I afterwards learned was Stent, the Astronomer Royal, with several workmen wielding spades and pickaxes. Stent was giving directions in a clear, high-pitched voice. He was standing on the cylinder, which was now evidently much cooler. His face was crimson and streaming with perspiration, and something seemed to have irritated him. A large portion of the cylinder had been uncovered, though its lower end was still embedded. As soon as Ogilvy saw me among the staring crowd on the edge of the pit, he called to me to come down, and asked me if I would mind going over to see Lord Hilton, the Lord of the Manor. The growing crowd, he said, was becoming a serious impediment to their excavations, especially the boys. They wanted a light railing put up, and helped to keep the people back. He told me that a faint stirring was occasionally still audible within the case, but that the workmen had failed to unscrew the top as it afforded no grip to them. The case appeared to be enormously thick, and it was possible that the faint sounds we heard represented a noisy tumult in the interior. I was very glad to do as he asked, and so become one of the privileged spectators within the contemplated enclosure. I failed to find Lord Hilton at his house, but I was told he was expected from London by the six o'clock train from Waterloo, and as it was then about a quarter past five, I went home, had some tea, and walked up to the station to waylay him. Chapter 4. The Cylinder Opens When I returned to the common, the sun was setting. Scattered groups were hurrying from the direction of Woking, and one or two persons were returning. The crowd about the pit had increased and stood out black against the lemon yellow of the sky. A couple of hundred people, perhaps. There were raised voices, and some sort of struggle appeared to be going on about the pit. Strange imaginings passed through my mind. As I drew nearer, I heard Stent's voice, Keep back! Keep back! A boy came running towards me. It's a move-in, he said to me as he passed. A screw-in and a screw-in out. I don't like it. I'm a going home, I am. I went on to the crowd. There were really, I should think, two or three hundred people elbowing and jostling one another, the one or two ladies there being by no means the least active. He's fallen in the pit! cried someone. Keep back, said several. The crowd swayed a little, and I elbowed my way through. Everyone seemed greatly excited, 
I heard a peculiar humming sound from the pit. I say, said Ogilvy, help keep these idiots back. We don't know what's in the confounded thing, you know. I saw a young man, a shop assistant in Woking. I believe he was, standing on the cylinder and trying to scramble out of the hole again. The crowd had pushed him in. The end of the cylinder was being screwed out from within. Nearly two feet of shining screw projected. Somebody blundered against me, and I narrowly missed being pitched onto the top of the screw. I turned, and as I did so, the screw must have come out, for the lid of the cylinder fell upon the gravel with a ringing concussion. I stuck my elbow into the person behind me and turned my head towards the thing again. For a moment, that circular cavity seemed perfectly black. I had the sunset in my eyes. I think everyone expected to see a man emerge, possibly something a little unlike us terrestrial men, but in all essentials, a man. I know I did. But looking, I presently saw something stirring within the shadow, greyish, billowy movements, one above another, and then two luminous discs, like eyes. Then, something resembling a little grey snake, about the thickness of a walking stick, coiled up out of the writhing middle and wriggled in the air towards me, and then another. A sudden chill came over me. There was a loud shriek from a woman behind. I half turned, keeping my eyes fixed upon the cylinder still, from which other tentacles were now projecting, and began pushing my way back from the edge of the pit. I saw astonishment giving place to horror on the faces of the people about me. I heard inarticulate exclamations on all sides. There was a general movement backwards. I saw the shopman struggling still on the edge of the pit. I found myself alone, and saw the people on the other side of the pit running off, stent among them. I looked again at the cylinder, and ungovernable terror gripped me. I stood petrified and staring. A big, greyish, rounded bulk, the size, perhaps, of a bear, was rising slowly and painfully out of the cylinder. As it bulged up and caught the light, it glistened like wet leather. Two large, dark-coloured eyes were regarding me steadfastly. The mass that framed them, the head of the thing, was rounded, and had, one might say, a face. There was a mouth under the eyes, the lipless brim of which quivered and panted, and dropped saliva. The whole creature heaved and pulsated convulsively. A lank, tentacular appendage gripped the edge of the cylinder, another swayed in the air. Those who have never seen a living Martian can scarcely imagine the strange horror of its appearance. The peculiar V-shaped mouth with its pointed upper lip, the absence of brow ridges, the absence of a chin beneath the wedge-like lower lip, the incessant quivering of this mouth, the gorgon groups of tentacles, the tumultuous breathing of the lungs in a strange atmosphere, the evident heaviness and painfulness of movement due to the greater gravitational energy of the earth, above all, the extraordinary intensity of the immense eyes, were at once vital, intense, inhuman, crippled, and monstrous. There was something fungoid in the oily brown skin, something in the clumsy deliberation of the tedious movements unspeakably nasty. Even at this first encounter, this first glimpse, I was overcome with disgust and dread. Suddenly, the monster vanished. It had toppled over the brim of the cylinder and fallen into the pit, with a thud like the fall of a great mass of leather. I heard it give a peculiar thick cry, and forthwith another of these creatures appeared darkly in the deep shadow of the aperture. I turned, and running madly, made for the first group of trees, perhaps a hundred yards away. But I ran, slantingly and stumbling, for I could not avert my face from these things. There, among some young pine trees and furze bushes, I stopped, panting, and waited further developments. The common round the sand pits was dotted with people, standing like myself in a half-fascinated terror, staring at these creatures or rather, at the heaped gravel at the edge of the pit in which they lay. And then, with a renewed horror, I saw a round, black object bobbing up and down on the edge of the pit. It was the head of the shopman who had fallen in, but showing as a little black object against the hot western sun. Now he got his shoulder and knee up, 
and again he seemed to slip back until only his head was visible. Suddenly he vanished, and I could have fancied a faint shriek had reached me. I had a momentary impulse to go back and help him that my fears overruled. Everything was then quite invisible, hidden by the deep pit and the heap of sand that the fall of the cylinder had made. Anyone coming along the road from Chobham or Woking would have been amazed at the sight, a dwindling multitude of perhaps a hundred people or more standing in a great irregular circle, in ditches, behind bushes, behind gates and hedges, saying little to one another, and that in short, excited shouts and staring, staring hard at a few heaps of sand. The barrow of ginger beer stood, a queer derelict, black against the burning sky, and in the sand pits was a row of deserted vehicles with their horses feeding out of nose bags or pawing the ground. Chapter 5 The Heat Ray After the glimpse I had had of the Martians emerging from the cylinder in which they had come to the earth from their planet, a kind of fascination paralyzed my actions. I remained standing knee-deep in the heather, staring at the mound that hid them. I was a battleground of fear and curiosity. I did not dare to go back towards the pit, but I felt a passionate longing to peer into it. I began walking, therefore, in a big curve, seeking some point of vantage and continually looking at the sand heaps that hid these newcomers to our earth. Once a leash of thin black whips, like the arms of an octopus, flashed across the sunset and was immediately withdrawn, and afterwards a thin rod rose up joint by joint, bearing at its apex a circular disc that spun with a wobbling motion. What could be going on there? Most of the spectators had gathered in one or two groups, one a little crowd towards Woking, the other a knot of people in the direction of Chobham. Evidently, they shared my mental conflict. There were few near me. One man I approached. He was, I perceived, a neighbour of mine, though I did not know his name, and accosted but it was scarcely a time for articulate conversation. What ugly brutes, he said. Good God, what ugly brutes. He repeated this over and over again. Did you see a man in the pit, I said, but he made no answer to that. We became silent and stood watching for a time side by side, deriving, I fancy, a certain comfort in one another's company. Then I shifted my position to a little knoll that gave me the advantage of a yard or more of elevation, and when I looked for him presently, he was walking towards Woking. The sunset faded to twilight before anything further happened. The crowd far away on the left, towards Woking, seemed to grow, and I heard now a faint murmur from it. The little knot of people towards Chobham dispersed. There was scarcely an intimation of movement from the pit, it was this, as much as anything, that gave people courage, and I suppose the new arrivals from Woking also helped to restore confidence. At any rate, as the dusk came on a slow, intermittent movement upon the sand pits began, a movement that seemed to gather force as the stillness of the evening about the cylinder remained unbroken. Vertical black figures in twos and threes would advance, stop, watch and advance again, spreading out as they did so in a thin, irregular crescent that promised to enclose the pit in its attenuated horns. I, too, on my side, began to move towards the pit. Then I saw some cabmen and others had walked boldly into the sand pits and heard the clatter of hooves and the gride of wheels. I saw a lad trundling off the barrow of apples, and then, within thirty yards of the pit, advancing from the direction of Horsell, I noted a little black knot of men, the foremost of whom was waving a white flag. This was the deputation. There had been a hasty consultation, and since the Martians were evidently, in spite of their repulsive forms, intelligent creatures, it had been resolved to show them by approaching them with signals that we too were intelligent. Flutter, flutter, went the flag, first to the right, then to the left. It was too far for me to recognize anyone there, but afterwards I learned that Ogilvy, Stent, and Henderson were with others in this attempt at communication. This little group had in its advance dragged inward, so to speak, the circumference of the now almost complete circle of people, and a number of dim black figures followed it at discreet distances. Suddenly there was a flash of light, 
and a quantity of luminous greenish smoke came out of the pit in three distinct puffs which drove up, one after the other, straight into the still air. This smoke, or flame perhaps, would be the better word for it, was so bright that the deep blue sky overhead and the hazy stretches of brown common towards Chertsey, set with black pine trees, seemed to darken abruptly as these puffs arose, and to remain the darker after their dispersal. At the same time, a faint hissing sound became audible. Beyond the pit stood the little wedge of people with the white flag at its apex, arrested by these phenomena, a little knot of small vertical black shapes upon the black ground. As the green smoke arose, their faces flashed out pallid green and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Slowly a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out from it. Forthwith flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. Then, by the light of their own destruction, I saw them staggering and falling, and their supporters turning to run. I stood staring, not as yet realizing that this was death leaping from man to man in that little distant crowd. All I felt was that it was something very strange, an almost noiseless and blinding flash of light, and a man fell headlong and lay still. And as the unseen shaft of heat passed over them, pine trees burst into fire, and every dry furze bush became with one dull thud a mass of flames. And far away towards Naphill, I saw the flashes of trees and hedges and wooden buildings suddenly set alight. It was sweeping round swiftly and steadily, this flaming death, this invisible, inevitable sword of heat. I perceived it coming towards me by the flashing bushes it touched, and was too astounded and stupefied to stir. I heard the crackle of fire in the sand pits, and the sudden squeal of a horse that was as suddenly stilled. Then it was as if an invisible yet intensely heated finger were drawn through the heather between me and the Martians, and all along a curving line beyond the sand pits, the dark ground smoked and crackled. Something fell with a crash far away to the left, where the road from Woking Station opens out on the common. Forthwith the hissing and humming ceased, and the black, dome-like object sank slowly out of sight into the pit. All this had happened with such swiftness that I had stood motionless, dumbfounded and dazzled by the flashes of light. Had that death swept through a full circle, it must inevitably have slain me in my surprise. But it passed and spared me, and left the night about me suddenly dark and unfamiliar. The undulating common seemed now dark almost to blackness, except where its roadways lay grey and pale under the deep blue sky of the early night. It was dark, and suddenly void of men. Overhead, the stars were mustering, and in the west, the sky was still a pale, bright, almost greenish blue. The tops of the pine trees and the roofs of Horsell came out sharp and black against the western afterglow. The Martians and their appliances were altogether invisible, save for that thin mast upon which their restless mirror wobbled. Patches of bush and isolated trees here and there smoked and glowed still, and the houses towards Woking Station were sending up spires of flame into the stillness of the evening air, Nothing was changed, save for that, and a terrible astonishment. The little group of black specks with the flag of white had been swept out of existence, and the stillness of the evening, so it seemed to me, had scarcely been broken. It came to me that I was upon this dark common, helpless, unprotected, and alone. Suddenly, like a thing falling upon me from without, came fear. With an effort I turned and began a stumbling run through the heather, the fear I felt was no rational fear, but a panic terror not only of the Martians, but of the dusk and stillness all about me. Such an extraordinary effect in unmanning me it had that I ran weeping silently as a child might do. 
Once I had turned, I did not dare to look back. I remember I felt an extraordinary persuasion that I was being played with, that presently, when I was upon the very verge of safety, this mysterious death, as swift as the passage of light, would leap after me from the pit about the cylinder and strike me down. Chapter 6 The Heat Ray in the Chobham Road It is still a matter of wonder how the Martians are able to slay men so swiftly and so silently. Many think that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the parabolic mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. But no one has absolutely proved these details. However it is done, it is certain that a beam of heat is the essence of the matter, heat and invisible instead of visible, light. Whatever is combustible flashes into flame at its touch, lead runs like water, it softens iron, cracks and melts glass, and when it falls upon water, incontinently, that explodes into steam. That night, nearly forty people lay under the starlight about the pit, charred and distorted beyond recognition, and all night long the common from Horsell to Maybury was deserted and brightly ablaze. The news of the massacre probably reached Chobham, Woking and Ottershaw about the same time. In Woking, the shops had closed when the tragedy happened, and a number of people, shop people and so forth, attracted by the stories they had heard, were walking over the Horsell Bridge and along the road between the hedges that runs out at last upon the common. You may imagine the young people brushed up after the labours of the day and making this novelty, as they would make any novelty, the excuse for walking together and enjoying a trivial flirtation. You may figure to yourself the hum of voices along the road in the gloaming. As yet, of course, few people in Woking even knew that the cylinder had opened, though poor Henderson had sent a messenger on a bicycle to the post office with a special wire to an evening paper. As these folks came out by twos and threes upon the open, they found little knots of people talking excitedly and peering at the spinning mirror over the sand pits, and the newcomers were, no doubt, soon infected by the excitement of the occasion. By half past eight, when the deputation was destroyed, there may have been a crowd of three hundred people or more at this place, besides those who had left the road to approach the Martians nearer. There were three policemen too, one of whom was mounted, doing their best, under instructions from Stent, to keep the people back and deter them from approaching the cylinder. There was some booing from those more thoughtless and excitable souls, to whom a crowd is always an occasion for noise and horseplay. Stent and Ogilvy, anticipating some possibilities of a collision, had telegraphed from Horsell to the barracks as soon as the Martians emerged for the help of a company of soldiers to protect these strange creatures from violence. After that, they returned to lead that ill-fated advance. The description of their death, as it was seen by the crowd, tallies very closely with my own impressions. The three puffs of green smoke, the deep humming note, and the flashes of flame. But that crowd of people had a far narrower escape than mine. Only the fact that a hummock of heathery sand intercepted the lower part of the heat ray saved them. Had the elevation of the parabolic mirror been a few yards higher, none could have lived to tell the tale. They saw the flashes and the men falling, and an invisible hand, as it were, lit the bushes as it hurried towards them through the twilight. Then, with a whistling note that rose above the droning of the pit, the beam swung close over their heads, lighting the tops of the beech trees that line the road, and splitting the bricks, smashing the windows, firing the window frames, and bringing down in crumbling ruin a portion of the gable of the house nearest the corner. In the sudden thud, hiss, and glare of the igniting trees, the panic-stricken crowd seems to have swayed hesitatingly for some moments. Sparks and burning twigs began to fall into the road, and single leaves like puffs of flame. Hats and dresses caught fire. Then came a crying from the common. 
There were shrieks and shouts, and suddenly a mounted policeman came galloping through the confusion with his hands clasped over his head, screaming. They're coming, a woman shrieked, and incontinently everyone was turning and pushing at those behind in order to clear their way to Woking again. They must have bolted as blindly as a flock of sheep. Where the road grows narrow and black between the high banks, the crowd jammed and a desperate struggle occurred. All that crowd did not escape. Three persons at least, two women and a little boy, were crushed and trampled there and left to die amid the terror and the darkness. Chapter 7. How I Reached Home For my own part, I remember nothing of my flight except the stress of blundering against trees and stumbling through the heather. All about me gathered the invisible terrors of the Martians. That pitiless sword of heat seemed whirling to and fro, flourishing overhead before it descended and smote me out of life. I came into the road between the crossroads and Horsel and ran along this to the crossroads. At last I could go no further. I was exhausted with the violence of my emotion and of my flight, and I staggered and fell by the wayside. That was near the bridge that crosses the canal by the gasworks. I fell and lay still. I must have remained there some time. I sat up, strangely perplexed. For a moment, perhaps, I could not clearly understand how I came there. My terror had fallen from me like a garment. My hat had gone, and my collar had burst away from its fastener. A few minutes before, there had only been three real things before me. The immensity of the night and space and nature, my own feebleness and anguish, and the near approach of death. Now it was as if something turned over, and the point of view altered abruptly. There was no sensible transition from one state of mind to the other. I was immediately the self of every day again, a decent, ordinary citizen. The silent common, the impulse of my flight, the starting flames, were as if they had been in a dream. I asked myself, had these latter things indeed happened? I could not credit it. I rose and walked unsteadily up the steep incline of the bridge. My mind was blank wonder. My muscles and nerves seemed drained of their strength. I dare say I staggered drunkenly. A head rose over the arch, and the figure of a workman carrying a basket appeared. Beside him ran a little boy. He passed me, wishing me good night. I was minded to speak to him, but did not. I answered his greeting with a meaningless mumble and went on over the bridge. Over the Maybury Arch, a train, a billowing tumult of white, firelit smoke and a long caterpillar of lighted windows went flying south. Clatter, clatter, clap, rap, and it had gone. A dim group of people talked in the gate of one of the houses in the pretty little row of gables that was called Oriental Terrace. It was all so real and so familiar, and that behind me, it was frantic, fantastic. Such things, I told myself, could not be. Perhaps I am a man of exceptional moods. I do not know how far my experience is common. At times I suffer from the strangest sense of detachment from myself and the world about me. I seem to watch it all from the outside, from somewhere inconceivably remote, out of time, out of space, out of the stress and tragedy of it all. This feeling was very strong upon me that night. Here was another side to my dream. But the trouble was the blank incongruity of this serenity and the swift death flying yonder, not two miles away. There was a noise of business from the gasworks, and the electric lamps were all alight. I stopped at the group of people. What news from the common? said I. There were two men and a woman at the gate. Eh? said one of the men, turning. What news from the common? I said. Ain't you just been there? asked the men. People seem fair silly about the common, said the woman over the gate. What's it all about? Haven't you heard of the men from Mars? said I. The creatures from Mars. Quite enough, said the woman over the gate. Thanks. And all three of them laughed. I felt foolish and angry. I tried and found I could not tell them what I had seen. They laughed again at my broken sentences. You'll hear more yet, I said, and went on to my home. I startled my wife at the doorway, so haggard was I. I went into the dining room, sat down, 
drank some wine, and so soon as I could collect myself sufficiently, I told her the things I had seen. The dinner, which was a cold one, had already been served, and remained neglected on the table while I told my story. There is one thing, I said, to allay the fears I had aroused. They are the most sluggish things I ever saw crawl. They may keep the pit and kill people who come near them, but they cannot get out of it. But the horror of them... Don't, dear, said my wife, knitting her brows and putting her hand on mine. Poor Ogilvy, I said, to think he may be lying dead there. My wife, at least, did not find my experience incredible. When I saw how deadly white her face was, I ceased abruptly. They may come here, she said again and again. I pressed her to take wine and tried to reassure her. They can scarcely move, I said. I began to comfort her and myself by repeating all that Ogilvy had told me of the impossibility of the Martians establishing themselves on the earth. In particular, I laid stress on the gravitational difficulty. On the surface of the earth, the force of gravity is three times what it is on the surface of Mars. A Martian, therefore, would weigh three times more than on Mars, albeit his muscular strength would be the same. His own body would be a cope of lead to him, therefore. That, indeed, was the general opinion. Both the Times and the Daily Telegraph, for instance, insisted on it the next morning, and both overlooked, just as I did, two obvious modifying influences. The atmosphere of the Earth, we now know, contains far more oxygen or far less argon, whichever way one likes to put it, than does Mars. The invigorating influences of this excess of oxygen upon the Martians indisputably did much to counterbalance the increased weight of their bodies. And, in the second place, we all overlook the fact that such mechanical intelligence as the Martian possessed was quite able to dispense with muscular exertion at a pinch. But I did not consider these points at the time, and so my reasoning was dead against the chances of the invaders. With wine and food, the confidence of my own table, and the necessity of reassuring my wife, I grew by insensible degrees courageous and secure. They have done a foolish thing, said I, fingering my wine glass. They are dangerous because, no doubt, they are mad with terror. Perhaps they expected to find no living things, certainly no intelligent living things. A shell in the pit, said I. If the worst comes to the worst, we'll kill them all. The intense excitement of the events had no doubt left my perceptive powers in a state of erethism. I remember that dinner table with extraordinary vividness even now. My dear wife's sweet, anxious face peering at me from under the pink lampshade, the white cloth with its silver and glass table furniture, for in those days even philosophical writers had many little luxuries, the crimson-purple wine in my glass, a photographically distinct. At the end of it, I sat, tempering nuts with a cigarette, regretting Ogilvy's rashness and denouncing the short-sighted timidity of the Martians. So some respectable dodo in the Mauritius might have lauded it in his nest and discussed the arrival of that shipful of pitiless sailors in want of animal food. We will peck them to death tomorrow, my dear. I did not know it, but that was the last civilized dinner I was to eat for very many strange and terrible days. Chapter 8 Friday Night The most extraordinary thing to my mind, of all the strange and wonderful things that happened upon that Friday, was the dovetailing of the commonplace habits of our social order with the first beginnings of the series of events that was to topple that social order headlong. If on Friday night you had taken a pair of compasses and drawn a circle with a radius of five miles round the Woking sand pits, I doubt if you would have had one human being outside it, unless it were some relation of stent, or of the three or four cyclists or London people lying dead on the common, whose emotions or habits were at all affected by the newcomers. Many people had heard of the cylinder, of course, and talked about it in their leisure, but it certainly did not make the sensation that an ultimatum to Germany would have done. In London that night, Poor Henderson's telegram describing the gradual unscrewing of the shot was judged to be a canard, and his evening paper, after wiring for authentication from him and receiving no reply, 
the man was killed, decided not to print a special edition. Even within the five-mile circle, the great majority of people were inert. I have already described the behavior of the men and women to whom I spoke. All over the district people were dining and supping. Working men were gardening after the labors of the day. Children were being put to bed. Young people were wandering through the lanes, love-making. Students sat over their books. Maybe there was a murmur in the village streets, a novel and dominant topic in the public houses, and here and there a messenger, or even an eyewitness of the later occurrences, caused a whirl of excitement, a shouting, and a running to and fro. But for the most part, the daily routine of working, eating, drinking, sleeping, went on as it had done for countless years, as though no planet Mars existed in the sky. Even at Woking Station and Horsell and Chobham that was the case. In Woking Junction, until a late hour, trains were stopping and going on, others were shunting on the sidings, passengers were alighting and waiting, and everything was proceeding in the most ordinary way. A boy from the town, trenching on Smith's monopoly, was selling papers with the afternoon's news. The ringing impact of trucks, the sharp whistle of the engines from the junction, mingled with their shouts of, Men from Mars! Excited men came into the station about nine o'clock with incredible tidings, and caused no more disturbance than drunkards might have done. People rattling Londonwards peered into the darkness outside the carriage windows, and saw only a rare, flickering, vanishing spark dance up from the direction of Horsell, a red glow and a thin veil of smoke driving across the stars, and thought that nothing more serious than a heath fire was happening. It was only round the edge of the common that any disturbance was perceptible. There were half a dozen villas burning on the Woking border, there were lights in all the houses on the common side of the three villages, and the people there kept awake till dawn. A curious crowd lingered restlessly, people coming and going but the crowd remaining, both on the Chobham and Horsell bridges. One or two adventurous souls, it was afterwards found, went into the darkness and crawled quite near the Martians. But they never returned, for now and again a light ray, like the beam of a warship searchlight, swept the common, and the heat ray was ready to follow. Save for such, that big area of common was silent and desolate, and the charred bodies lay about on it all night under the stars and all the next day. A noise of hammering from the pit was heard by many people. So you have the state of things on Friday night. In the centre, sticking into the skin of our old planet Earth like a poisoned dart, was this cylinder. But the poison was scarcely working yet. Around it was a patch of silent common, smouldering in places, and with a few dark, dimly seen objects lying in contorted attitudes here and there. Here and there was a burning bush or tree. Beyond was a fringe of excitement, and farther than that fringe the inflammation had not crept as yet. In the rest of the world, the stream of life still flowed as it had flowed for immemorial years. The fever of war that would presently clog vein and artery deaden nerve and destroy brain, had still to develop. All night long the Martians were hammering and stirring, sleepless, indefatigable, at work upon the machines they were making ready, and ever and again a puff of greenish-white smoke whirled up to the starlit sky. About eleven a company of soldiers came through Horsell and deployed along the edge of the common to form a cordon. Later a second company marched through Chobham to deploy on the north side of the common. Several officers from the Inkerman barracks had been on the common earlier in the day, and one, Major Eden, was reported to be missing. The colonel of the regiment came to the Chobham Bridge and was busy questioning the crowd at midnight. The military authorities were certainly alive to the seriousness of the business. About eleven, the next morning's papers were able to say, a squadron of hussars, two maxims, and about 400 men of the Cardigan Regiment started from Aldershot. A few seconds after midnight, the crowd in the Chertsey Road, woking, saw a star fall from heaven into the pine woods to the northwest. It had a greenish color and caused a silent brightness like summer lightning. This was the second cylinder. Chapter 9. The Fighting Begins 
Saturday lives in my memory as a day of suspense. It was a day of lassitude too, hot and close, with, I am told, a rapidly fluctuating barometer. I had slept but little, though my wife had succeeded in sleeping, and I rose early. I went into my garden before breakfast and stood listening, but towards the common there was nothing stirring but a lark. The milkman came as usual. I heard the rattle of his chariot, and I went round to the side gate to ask the latest news. He told me that during the night the Martians had been surrounded by troops and that guns were expected. Then, a familiar reassuring note, I heard a train running towards Woking. They aren't to be killed, said the milkman, if that can possibly be avoided. I saw my neighbour gardening, chatted with him for a time, and then strolled in to breakfast. It was a most unexceptional morning. My neighbour was of opinion that the troops would be able to capture or to destroy the Martians during the day. It's a pity they make themselves so unapproachable, he said. It would be curious to know how they live on another planet. We might learn a thing or two. He came up to the fence and extended a handful of strawberries, for his gardening was as generous as it was enthusiastic. At the same time, he told me of the burning of the pine woods about the Byfleet golf links. They say, said he, that there's another of those blessed things fallen there, number two. But one's enough, surely. This lot'll cost the insurance people a pretty penny before everything's settled. He laughed with an air of the greatest good humour as he said this. The woods, he said, were still burning, and pointed out a haze of smoke to me. They will be hot underfoot for days, on account of the thick soil of pine needles and turf, he said, and then grew serious over poor Ogilvy. After breakfast, instead of working, I decided to walk down towards the common. Under the railway bridge I found a group of soldiers, sappers, I think, men in small round caps, dirty red jackets unbuttoned, and showing their blue shirts, dark trousers, and boots coming to the calf. They told me no one was allowed over the canal, and looking along the road towards the bridge, I saw one of the cardigan men standing sentinel there. I talked with these soldiers for a time. I told them of my sight of the Martians on the previous evening. None of them had seen the Martians, and they had but the vaguest ideas of them, so that they plied me with questions. They said that they did not know who had authorised the movements of the troops. Their idea was that a dispute had arisen at the horse guards. The ordinary sapper is a great deal better educated than the common soldier, and they discussed the peculiar conditions of the possible fight with some acuteness. I described the heat ray to them, and they began to argue among themselves. Crawl up under cover and rush him, say I, said one. Get A.H.T., said another. What's cover against this irrite? Sticks to cook ya. What we got to do is to go as near as the ground'll let us, and then drive a trench. Blow your trenches. You always want trenches. You ought to have been born a rabbit snippy. Ain't they got any necks then? said a third abruptly, a little contemplative dark man smoking a pipe. I repeated my description. Octopuses, said he. That's what I calls them. Talk about fishers of men. Fighters of fish it is this time. It ain't no murder killing beasts like that, said the first speaker. Why not shell the darn things straight off and finish them, said the little dark man. You can't tell what they might do. Where's your shells, said the first speaker. There ain't no time. Do it in a rush. That's my tip, and do it at once. So they discussed it. After a while I left them, and went on to the railway station to get as many morning papers as I could, but I will not weary the reader with a description of that long morning and of the longer afternoon. I did not succeed in getting a glimpse of the common, for even Horsell and Chobham church towers were in the hands of the military authorities. The soldiers I addressed didn't know anything. The officers were mysterious as well as busy. I found people in the town quite secure again in the presence of the military, and I heard for the first time from Marshall, the tobacconist, that his son was among the dead on the common. The soldiers had made the people on the outskirts of Horsell lock up and leave their houses. 
I got back to lunch about two, very tired for, as I have said, the day was extremely hot and dull. And in order to refresh myself, I took a cold bath in the afternoon. About half past four, I went up to the railway station to get an evening paper, for the morning papers had contained only a very inaccurate description of the killing of Stent, Henderson, Ogilvy, and the others. But there was little I didn't know. The Martians did not show an inch of themselves. They seemed busy in their pit, and there was a sound of hammering and an almost continuous streamer of smoke. Apparently, they were busy getting ready for a struggle. Fresh attempts have been made to signal, but without success, was the stereotyped formula of the papers. A sapper told me it was done by a man in a ditch with a flag on a long pole. The Martians took as much notice of such advances as we should of the lowing of a cow. I must confess the sight of all this armament, all this preparation, greatly excited me. My imagination became belligerent and defeated the invaders in a dozen striking ways. Something of my schoolboy dreams of battle and heroism came back. It hardly seemed a fair fight to me at that time. They seemed very helpless in that pit of theirs. About three o'clock, there began the thud of a gun at measured intervals from Chertsey or Adelstone. I learned that the smouldering pine wood into which the second cylinder had fallen was being shelled in the hope of destroying that object before it opened. It was only about five, however, that a field gun reached Chobham for use against the first body of Martians. About six in the evening, as I sat at tea with my wife in the summer house talking vigorously about the battle that was lowering upon us, I heard a muffled detonation from the common and immediately after a gust of firing. Close on the heels of that came a violent rattling crash, quite close to us, that shook the ground, and starting out upon the lawn, I saw the tops of the trees about the Oriental College burst into smoky red flame and the tower of the little church beside it slide down into ruin. The pinnacle of the mosque had vanished, and the roof line of the college itself looked as if a hundred-ton gun had been at work upon it. One of our chimneys cracked as if a shot had hit it, flew, and a piece of it came clattering down the tiles and made a heap of broken red fragments upon the flower bed by my study window. I and my wife stood amazed. Then I realized that the crest of Maybury Hill must be within range of the Martian's heat ray, now that the college was cleared out of the way. At that, I gripped my wife's arm, and without ceremony ran her out into the road. Then I fetched out the servant, telling her I would go upstairs myself for the box she was clamoring for. We can't possibly stay here, I said, and as I spoke the firing reopened for a moment upon the common. But where are we to go? said my wife in terror. I thought perplexed. Then I remembered her cousins at Leatherhead. Leatherhead? I shouted above the sudden noise. She looked away from me downhill. The people were coming out of their houses, astonished. How are we to get to Leatherhead? she said. Down the hill I saw a bevy of hussars ride under the railway bridge. Three galloped through the open gates of the Oriental College. Two others dismounted and began running from house to house. The sun, shining through the smoke that drove up from the tops of the trees, seemed blood red and threw an unfamiliar lurid light upon everything. Stop here, said I. You are safe here. And I started off at once for the spotted dog, for I knew the landlord had a horse and dog cart. I ran, for I perceived that in a moment everyone upon this side of the hill would be moving. I found him in his bar, quite unaware of what was going on behind his house. A man stood with his back to me, talking to him. I must have a pound, said the landlord, and I've no one to drive it. I'll give you two, said I, over the stranger's shoulder. What for? And I'll bring it back by midnight, I said. Lord, said the landlord, what's the hurry? I'm selling my bit of a pig. Two pounds and you bring it back? What's going on now? I explained hastily that I had to leave my home, and so secured the dog cart. At the time, it did not seem to me nearly so urgent that the landlord should leave his. I took care to have the cart there and then, drove it off down the road, and leaving it in charge of my wife and servant, rushed into my house and packed a few valuables, such plate as we had, and so forth. The beech trees below the house were burning while I did this, 
and the palings up the road glowed red. While I was occupied in this way, one of the dismounted hussars came running up. He was going from house to house, warning people to leave. He was going on as I came out of my front door, lugging my treasures done up in a tablecloth. I shouted after him, What news? He turned, stared, bawled something about crawling out in a thing like a dish cover and ran onto the gate of the house at the crest. A sudden whirl of black smoke driving across the road hid him for a moment. I ran to my neighbor's door and rapped to satisfy myself of what I already knew, that his wife had gone to London with him and had locked up their house. I went in again, according to my promise, to get my servant's box, lugged it out, clapped it beside her on the tail of the dog cart, and then caught the reins and jumped up into the driver's seat beside my wife. In another moment, we were clear of the smoke and noise and spanking down the opposite slope of Maybury Hill towards Old Woking. In front was a quiet, sunny landscape, a wheat field ahead on either side of the road, and the Maybury Inn with its swinging sign. I saw the doctor's cart ahead of me. At the bottom of the hill, I turned my head to look at the hillside I was leaving. Thick streamers of black smoke shot with threads of red fire were driving up into the still air and throwing dark shadows upon the green treetops eastward. The smoke already extended far away to the east and west, to the Byfleet pine woods eastward and to Woking on the west. The road was dotted with people running towards us, and very faint now, but very distinct through the hot, quiet air one heard the whir of a machine gun that was presently stilled and an intermittent cracking of rifles. Apparently, the Martians were setting fire to everything within range of their heat ray. I am not an expert driver, and I had immediately to turn my attention to the horse. When I looked back again, the second hill had hidden the black smoke. I slashed the horse with the whip and gave him a loose rein until Woking and Send lay between us and that quivering tumult. I overtook and passed the doctor between Woking and Send. Chapter 10. In the Storm Leatherhead is about twelve miles from Maybury Hill. The scent of hay was in the air through the lush meadows beyond Pierford, and the hedges on either side were sweet and gay with multitudes of dog roses. The heavy firing that had broken out while we were driving down Maybury Hill ceased as abruptly as it began leaving the evening very peaceful and still. We got to Leatherhead without misadventure about nine o'clock, and the horse had an hour's rest while I took supper with my cousins and commended my wife to their care. My wife was curiously silent throughout the drive and seemed oppressed with forebodings of evil. I talked to her reassuringly, pointing out that the Martians were tied to the pit by sheer heaviness, and at the utmost could but crawl a little out of it, but she answered only in monosyllables. Had it not been for my promise to the innkeeper, she would, I think, have urged me to stay in Leatherhead that night. Would that I had. Her face, I remember, was very white as we parted. For my own part, I had been feverishly excited all day. Something very like the war fever that occasionally runs through a civilized community had got into my blood, and in my heart I was not so very sorry that I had to return to Maybury that night. I was even afraid that that last fusillade I had heard might mean the extermination of our invaders from Mars. I can best express my state of mind by saying that I wanted to be in at the death. It was nearly eleven when I started to return. The night was unexpectedly dark. To me, walking out of the lighted passage of my cousin's house, it seemed indeed black and it was as hot and close as the day. Overhead the clouds were driving fast, albeit not a breath stirred the shrubs about us. My cousin's man lit both lamps. Happily, I knew the road intimately. My wife stood in the light of the doorway and watched me until I jumped up into the dog cart. Then abruptly she turned and went in, leaving my cousin side by side wishing me good hap. I was a little depressed at first with the contagion of my wife's fears, but very soon my thoughts reverted to the Martians. At that time, I was absolutely in the dark as to the course of the evening's fighting. I did not know even the circumstances that had precipitated the conflict. As I came through Ockham, for that was the way I returned, and not through Send and Old Woking, I saw along the western horizon a blood-red glow, 
which as I drew nearer, crept slowly up the sky. The driving clouds of the gathering thunderstorm mingled there with masses of black and red smoke. Ripley Street was deserted, and except for a lighted window or so, the village showed not a sign of life. But I narrowly escaped an accident at the corner of the road to Pierford, where a knot of people stood with their backs to me. They said nothing to me as I passed. I do not know what they knew of the things happening beyond the hill, nor do I know if the silent houses I passed on my way were sleeping securely, or deserted and empty, or harassed and watching against the terror of the night. From Ripley until I came through Pierford, I was in the valley of the way, and the red glare was hidden from me. As I ascended the little hill beyond Pierford Church, the glare came into view again, and the trees about me shivered with the first intimation of the storm that was upon me. Then I heard midnight peeling out from Pierford Church behind me, and then came the silhouette of Maybury Hill, with its treetops and roofs black and sharp against the red. Even as I beheld this, a lurid green glare lit the road about me and showed the distant woods towards Adelstone. I felt a tug at the reins. I saw that the driving clouds had been pierced, as it were, by a thread of green fire, suddenly lighting their confusion and falling into the field to my left. It was the third falling star. Close on its apparition, and blindingly violet by contrast, danced out the first lightning of the gathering storm, and the thunder burst like a rocket overhead. The horse took the bit between his teeth and bolted, a moderate incline runs towards the foot of Maybury Hill, and down this we clattered. Once the lightning had begun, it went on in as rapid a succession of flashes as I have ever seen. The thunderclaps, treading one on the heels of another, and with a strange crackling accompaniment, sounded more like the working of a gigantic electric machine than the usual detonating reverberations. The flickering light was blinding and confusing and a thin hail smote gustily at my face as I drove down the slope. At first I regarded little but the road before me, and then abruptly my attention was arrested by something that was moving rapidly down the opposite slope of Maybury Hill. At first I took it for the wet roof of a house, but one flash following another showed it to be in swift rolling movement. It was an elusive vision, a moment of bewildering darkness. And then, in a flash like daylight, the red masses of the orphanage near the crest of the hill, the green tops of the pine trees, and this problematical object came out clear and sharp and bright. And this thing I saw, how can I describe it? A monstrous tripod, higher than many houses, striding over the young pine trees and smashing them aside in its career, a walking engine of glittering metal, striding now across the heather. Articulate ropes of steel dangling from it, and the clattering tumult of its passage mingling with the riot of the thunder. A flash, and it came out vividly, heeling over one way with two feet in the air, to vanish and reappear almost instantly as it seemed, with the next flash a hundred yards nearer. Can you imagine a milking stool tilted and bowled violently along the ground? That was the impression those instant flashes gave. But instead of a milking stool, imagine it a great body of machinery on a tripod stand. Then suddenly, the trees in the pine wood ahead of me were parted, as brittle reeds are parted by a man thrusting through them. They were snapped off and driven headlong, and a second huge tripod appeared, rushing as it seemed headlong towards me, and I was galloping hard to meet it. At the sight of the second monster, my nerve went altogether. Not stopping to look again, I wrenched the horse's head hard round to the right, and in another moment the dog cart had heeled over upon the horse. The shafts smashed noisily, and I was flung sideways and fell heavily into a shallow pool of water. I crawled out almost immediately and crouched, my feet still in the water, under a clump of furs. The horse lay motionless, his neck was broken, poor brute and by the lightning flashes I saw the black bulk of the overturned dog cart and the silhouette of the wheel still spinning slowly. In another moment, the colossal mechanism went striding by me and passed uphill towards Pierford. Seen nearer, the thing was incredibly strange, for it was no mere insensate machine driving on its way. 
Machine it was, with a ringing metallic pace and long, flexible, glittering tentacles, one of which gripped a young pine tree, swinging and rattling about its strange body. It picked its road as it went striding along, and the brazen hood that surmounted it moved to and fro with the inevitable suggestion of a head looking about. Behind the main body was a huge mass of white metal, like a gigantic fisherman's basket, and puffs of green smoke squirted out from the joints of the limbs as the monster swept by me. And in an instant, it was gone. So much I saw then all vaguely for the flickering of the lightning in blinding highlights and dense black shadows. As it passed, it set up an exultant, deafening howl that drowned the thunder. Alu, alu! And in another minute, it was with its companion, half a mile away, stooping over something in the field. I have no doubt this thing in the field was the third of the ten cylinders they had fired at us from Mars. For some minutes I lay there in the rain and darkness watching, by the intermittent light, these monstrous beings of metal moving about in the distance, over the hedgetops. A thin hail was now beginning, and as it came and went, their figures grew misty, and then flashed into clearness again. Now and then came a gap in the lightning, and the night swallowed them up. I was soaked with hail above and puddle water below. It was some time before my blank astonishment would let me struggle up the bank to a drier position or think at all of my imminent peril. Not far from me was a little one-roomed squatter's hut of wood, surrounded by a patch of potato garden. I struggled to my feet at last, and crouching and making use of every chance of cover, I made a run for this. I hammered at the door, but I could not make the people hear if there were any people inside and after a time I desisted, and availing myself of a ditch for the greater part of the way, succeeded in crawling, unobserved by these monstrous machines, into the pine woods towards Maybury. Under cover of this I pushed on, wet and shivering now, towards my own house. I walked among the trees trying to find the footpath. It was very dark indeed in the wood, for the lightning was now becoming infrequent, and the hail, which was pouring down in a torrent, fell in columns through the gaps in the heavy foliage. If I had fully realized the meaning of all the things I had seen, I should have immediately worked my way round through Byfleet to Street Cobham, and so gone back to rejoin my wife at Leatherhead. But that night, the strangeness of things about me, and my physical wretchedness, prevented me, for I was bruised, weary, wet to the skin, deafened and blinded by the storm. I had a vague idea of going on to my own house, and that was as much motive as I had. I staggered through the trees, fell into a ditch and bruised my knees against a plank, and finally splashed out into the lane that ran down from the college arms. I say splashed, for the storm water was sweeping the sand down the hill in a muddy torrent. There in the darkness, a man blundered into me and sent me reeling back. He gave a cry of terror, sprang sideways, and rushed on before I could gather my wits sufficiently to speak to him. So heavy was the stress of the storm just at this place that I had the hardest task to win my way up the hill. I went close up to the fence on the left and worked my way along its palings. Near the top, I stumbled upon something soft, and by a flash of lightning saw between my feet a heap of black broadcloth and a pair of boots. Before I could distinguish clearly how the man lay, the flicker of light had passed. I stood over him, waiting for the next flash. When it came, I saw that he was a sturdy man, cheaply but not shabbily dressed. His head was bent under his body, and he lay crumpled up close to the fence, as though he had been flung violently against it. Overcoming the repugnance natural to one who had never before touched a dead body, I stooped, and turned him over to feel for his heart. He was quite dead. Apparently his neck had been broken. The lightning flashed for a third time, and his face leaped upon me. I sprang to my feet. It was the landlord of the spotted dog whose conveyance I had taken. I stepped over him gingerly and pushed on up the hill. I made my way by the police station and the college arms towards my own house. 
Nothing was burning on the hillside, though from the common there still came a red glare and a rolling tumult of ruddy smoke beating up against the drenching hail. So far as I could see by the flashes, the houses about me were mostly uninjured. By the college arms, a dark heap lay in the road. Down the road towards Maybury Bridge, there were voices and the sound of feet, but I had not the courage to shout or to go to them. I let myself in with my latchkey, closed, locked and bolted the door, staggered to the foot of the staircase and sat down. My imagination was full of those striding metallic monsters and of the dead body smashed against the fence. I crouched at the foot of the staircase with my back to the wall, shivering violently. Chapter 11 At the Window I have already said that my storms of emotion have a trick of exhausting themselves. After a time I discovered that I was cold and wet and with little pools of water about me on the stair carpet. I got up almost mechanically, went into the dining room and drank some whiskey, and then I was moved to change my clothes. After I had done that, I went upstairs to my study, but why I did so, I do not know. The window of my study looks over the trees and the railway towards Horsell Common. In the hurry of our departure, this window had been left open. The passage was dark, and by contrast with the picture the window frame enclosed, the side of the room seemed impenetrably dark. I stopped short in the doorway. The thunderstorm had passed. The towers of the Oriental College and the pine trees about it had gone, and very far away, lit by a vivid red glare, the common about the sand pits was visible. Across the light, huge black shapes, grotesque and strange, moved busily to and fro. It seemed indeed as if the whole country in that direction was on fire, a broad hillside set with minute tongues of flame, swaying and writhing with the gusts of the dying storm and throwing a red reflection upon the cloud scud above. Every now and then a haze of smoke from some nearer conflagration drove across the window and hid the Martian shapes. I could not see what they were doing, nor the clear form of them, nor recognize the black objects they were busied upon. Neither could I see the nearer fire, though the reflections of it danced on the wall and ceiling of the study. A sharp, resinous tang of burning was in the air. I closed the door noiselessly and crept towards the window. As I did so, the view opened out until, on the one hand, it reached to the houses about Woking Station, and on the other, to the charred and blackened pine woods of Byfleet. There was a light down below the hill, on the railway, near the arch, and several of the houses along the Maybury Road and the streets near the station were glowing ruins. The light upon the railway puzzled me at first. There were a black heap and a vivid glare, and to the right of that, a row of yellow oblongs. Then I perceived this was a wrecked train, the forepart smashed and on fire, the hinder carriages still upon the rails. Between these three main centres of light, the houses, the train, and the burning county towards Chobham, stretched irregular patches of dark country, broken here and there by intervals of dimly glowing and smoking ground. It was the strangest spectacle, the black expanse set with fire. It reminded me, more than anything else, of the potteries at night. At first I could distinguish no people at all, though I peered intently for them. Later I saw against the light of Woking Station a number of black figures hurrying one after the other across the line, and this was the little world in which I had been living securely for years, this fiery chaos. What had happened in the last seven hours I still did not know, nor did I know, though I was beginning to guess, the relation between these mechanical colossi and the sluggish lumps I had seen disgorged from the cylinder. With a queer feeling of impersonal interest, I turned my desk chair to the window, sat down, and stared at the blackened country, and particularly at the three gigantic black things that were going to and fro in the glare about the sand pits. They seemed amazingly busy. I began to ask myself what they could be. Were they intelligent mechanisms? Such a thing I felt was impossible. Or did a Martian sit within each, ruling, directing, using, 
much as a man's brain sits and rules in his body. I began to compare the things to human machines, to ask myself for the first time in my life how an ironclad or a steam engine would seem to an intelligent lower animal. The storm had left the sky clear, and over the smoke of the burning land the little fading pinpoint of Mars was dropping into the west when a soldier came into my garden. I heard a slight scraping at the fence, and rousing myself from the lethargy that had fallen upon me, I looked down and saw him dimly, clambering over the palings. At the sight of another human being my torpor passed, and I leaned out of the window eagerly. Hist! said I in a whisper. He stopped astride of the fence in doubt. Then he came over and across the lawn to the corner of the house. He bent down and stepped softly. Who's there? he said, also whispering, standing under the window and peering up. Where are you going? I asked. God knows. Are you trying to hide? That's it. Come into the house, I said. I went down, unfastened the door, and let him in, and locked the door again. I could not see his face. He was hatless, and his coat was unbuttoned. My God, he said as I drew him in. What has happened? I asked. What hasn't? In the obscurity I could see he made a gesture of despair. They wiped us out, simply wiped us out, he repeated again and again. He followed me, almost mechanically, into the dining room. Take some whiskey, I said, pouring out a stiff dose. He drank it. Then abruptly he sat down before the table, put his head on his arms, and began to sob and weep like a little boy in a perfect passion of emotion, while I, with a curious forgetfulness of my own recent despair, stood beside him, wondering. It was a long time before he could steady his nerves to answer my questions, and then he answered perplexingly and brokenly. He was a driver in the artillery, and had only come into action about seven. At that time, firing was going on across the common, and it was said the first party of Martians were crawling slowly towards their second cylinder under cover of a metal shield. Later, this shield staggered up on tripod legs and became the first of the fighting machines I had seen. The gun he drove had been unlimbered near Horsell in order to command the sand pits, and its arrival it was that had precipitated the action. As the limber gunners went to the rear, his horse trod in a rabbit hole and came down, throwing him into a depression of the ground. At the same moment, the gun exploded behind him. The ammunition blew up, there was fire all about him, and he found himself lying under a heap of charred dead men and dead horses. I lay still, he said, scared out of my wits, with the forequarter of a horse atop of me. We'd been wiped out, and the smell, good God, like burnt meat. I was hurt across the back by the fall of the horse, and there I had to lie until I felt better. Just like parade it had been a minute before, then stumble, bang, swish. Wiped out, he said. He had hid under the dead horse for a long time, peeping out furtively across the common. The cardigan men had tried a rush in skirmishing order at the pit, simply to be swept out of existence. Then the monster had risen to its feet, and had begun to walk leisurely to and fro across the common among the few fugitives, with its head-like hood turning about exactly like the head of a cowled human being. A kind of arm carried a complicated metallic case, about which green flashes scintillated, and out of the funnel of this there smoked the heat ray. In a few minutes there was, so far as the soldier could see, not a living thing left upon the common and every bush and tree upon it that was not already a blackened skeleton was burning. The hussars had been on the road beyond the curvature of the ground, and he saw nothing of them. He heard the maxims rattle for a time, and then become still. The giant saved Woking Station and its cluster of houses until the last. Then in a moment the heat ray was brought to bear, and the town became a heap of fiery ruins. Then the thing shut off the heat ray, and turning its back upon the artilleryman, began to waddle away towards the smouldering pine woods that sheltered the second cylinder. As it did so, a second glittering titan built itself up out of the pit. The second monster followed the first, and at that the artilleryman began to crawl very cautiously across the hot heather ash towards Horsell. 
He managed to get alive into the ditch by the side of the road, and so escaped to Woking. There his story became ejaculatory. The place was impassable. It seems there were a few people alive there, frantic for the most part, and many burned and scalded. He was turned aside by the fire and hid among some almost scorching heaps of broken wall as one of the Martian giants returned. He saw this one pursue a man, catch him up in one of its steely tentacles and knock his head against the trunk of a pine tree. At last, after nightfall, the artilleryman made a rush for it and got over the railway embankment. Since then, he had been skulking along towards Maybury in the hope of getting out of danger Londonward. People were hiding in trenches and cellars, and many of the survivors had made off towards Woking Village and Send. He had been consumed with thirst until he found one of the water mains near the railway arch smashed, and the water bubbling out like a spring upon the road. That was the story I got from him, bit by bit. He grew calmer, telling me and trying to make me see the things he had seen. He had eaten no food since midday, he told me early in his narrative, and I found some mutton and bread in the pantry and brought it into the room. We lit no lamp for fear of attracting the Martians, and ever and again our hands would touch upon bread or meat. As he talked, things about us came darkly out of the darkness, and the trampled bushes and broken rose trees outside the window grew distinct. It would seem that a number of men or animals had rushed across the lawn. I began to see his face, blackened and haggard, as no doubt mine was also. When we had finished eating, we went softly upstairs to my study, and I looked again out of the open window. In one night, the valley had become a valley of ashes. The fires had dwindled now. Where flames had been, there were now streamers of smoke. But the countless ruins of shattered and gutted houses and blasted and blackened trees that the night had hidden stood out now gaunt and terrible in the pitiless light of dawn. Yet here and there, some object had had the luck to escape. A white railway signal here, the end of a greenhouse there, white and fresh amid the wreckage. Never before in the history of warfare had destruction been so indiscriminate and so universal. And shining with the growing light of the east, three of the metallic giants stood about the pit, their cowls rotating as though they were surveying the desolation they had made. It seemed to me that the pit had been enlarged, and ever and again, puffs of vivid green vapour streamed up and out of it towards the brightening dawn. Streamed up, whirled, broke, and vanished. Beyond were the pillars of fire about Chobham. They became pillars of bloodshot smoke at the first touch of day. Chapter 12 What I Saw of the Destruction of Weybridge and Shepperton As the dawn grew brighter, we withdrew from the window from which we had watched the Martians and went very quietly downstairs. The artilleryman agreed with me that the house was no place to stay in. He proposed, he said, to make his way Londonward and thence rejoin his battery. No twelve of the horse artillery. My plan was to return at once to Leatherhead and so greatly had the strength of the Martians impressed me that I had determined to take my wife to Newhaven and go with her out of the country forthwith for I already perceived clearly that the country about London must inevitably be the scene of a disastrous struggle before such creatures as these could be destroyed. Between us and Leatherhead, however, lay the third cylinder, with its guarding giants. Had I been alone, I think I should have taken my chance and struck across country. But the artilleryman dissuaded me. It's no kindness to the right sort of wife, he said, to make her a widow. And in the end, I agreed to go with him, under cover of the woods, northward as far as Street Cobham before I parted with him. Thence I would make a big detour by Epsom to reach Leatherhead. I should have started at once, but my companion had been in active service, and he knew better than that. He made me ransack the house for a flask, which he filled with whiskey, and we lined every available pocket with packets of biscuits and slices of meat. Then we crept out of the house and ran as quickly as we could down the ill-made road by which I had come overnight. The houses seemed deserted. In the road lay a group of three charred bodies close together, struck dead by the heat ray, and here and there were things that people had dropped, a clock, a slipper, 
a silver spoon, and the like poor valuables. At the corner, turning up towards the post office, a little cart filled with boxes and furniture and horseless heeled over on a broken wheel. A cash box had been hastily smashed open and thrown under the debris. Except the lodge at the orphanage, which was still on fire, none of the houses had suffered very greatly here. The heat ray had shaved the chimney tops and passed. Yet, save ourselves, there did not seem to be a living soul on Maybury Hill. The majority of the inhabitants had escaped, I suppose, by way of the old Woking Road, the road I had taken when I drove to Leatherhead, or they had hidden. We went down the lane by the body of the man in black, sodden now from the overnight hail, and broke into the woods at the foot of the hill. We pushed through these towards the railway without meeting a soul. The woods across the line were but the scarred and blackened ruins of woods. For the most part, the trees had fallen, but a certain proportion still stood, dismal grey stems with dark brown foliage instead of green. On our side, the fire had done no more than scorch the nearer trees. It had failed to secure its footing. In one place, the woodman had been at work on Saturday. Trees, felled and freshly trimmed, lay in a clearing, with heaps of sawdust by the sawing machine and its engine. Hard by was a temporary hut, deserted. There was not a breath of wind this morning, and everything was strangely still. Even the birds were hushed, and as we hurried along, I and the artillery man talked in whispers and looked now and again over our shoulders. Once or twice, we stopped to listen. After a time, we drew near the road, and as we did so, we heard the clatter of hooves and saw through the tree stems three cavalry soldiers riding slowly towards Woking. We hailed them, and they halted while we hurried towards them. It was a lieutenant and a couple of privates of the 8th Hussars, with a stand like a theodolite, which the artilleryman told me was a heliograph. "'You are the first men I've seen coming this way this morning,' said the lieutenant. "'What's brewing?' His voice and face were eager. The men behind him stared curiously. The artilleryman jumped down the bank into the road and saluted. "'Gun destroyed last night, sir. Have been hiding. Trying to rejoin battery, sir. You'll come in sight of the Martians, I expect, about half a mile along this road. "'What the dickens are they like?' asked the lieutenant. "'Giants in armour, sir. Hundred feet high, three legs and a body like aluminium, with a mighty great head in a hood, sir.' "'Get out!' said the lieutenant. "'What confounded nonsense!' "'You'll see, sir. They carry a kind of box, sir, that shoots fire and strikes you dead.' "'What do you mean? A gun?' No, sir, and the artilleryman began a vivid account of the heat ray. Halfway through, the lieutenant interrupted him and looked up at me. I was still standing on the bank by the side of the road. It's perfectly true, I said. Well, said the lieutenant, I suppose it's my business to see it too. Look here, to the artilleryman. We're detailed here, clearing people out of their houses. You better go along and report yourself to Brigadier General Marvin and tell him all you know. He's at Weybridge. Know the way? I do, I said, and he turned his horse southward again. Half a mile, you say, said he. At most, I answered, and pointed over the treetops southward. He thanked me and rode on, and we saw them no more. Farther along, we came upon a group of three women and two children in the road, busy clearing out a labourer's cottage. They had got hold of a little hand truck and were piling it up with unclean-looking bundles and shabby furniture. They were all too assiduously engaged to talk to us as we passed. By Byfleet Station, we emerged from the pine trees and found the country calm and peaceful under the morning sunlight. We were far beyond the range of the heat ray there, and had it not been for the silent desertion of some of the houses, the stirring movement of packing in others, and the knot of soldiers standing on the bridge over the railway and staring down the line towards Woking, the day would have seemed very like any other Sunday. Several farm wagons and carts were moving creakily along the road to Adelstone, and suddenly, through the gate of a field, we saw, across a stretch of flat meadow, six twelve-pounders standing neatly at equal distances, pointing towards Woking. The gunners stood by the guns waiting, and the ammunition wagons were at a business-like distance. 
The men stood almost as if under inspection. That's good, said I. They will get one fair shot at any rate. The artilleryman hesitated at the gate. I shall go on, he said. Farther on towards Weybridge, just over the bridge, there were a number of men in white fatigue jackets throwing up a long rampart and more guns behind. It's balls and arrows against the lightning anyhow, said the artilleryman. They haven't seen that fire beam yet. The officers, who were not actively engaged, stood and stared over the treetops southwestward, and the men digging would stop every now and again to stare in the same direction. Byfleet was in a tumult, people packing, and a score of hussars, some of them dismounted, some on horseback, were hunting them about. Three or four black government wagons, with crosses in white circles and an old omnibus, among other vehicles, were being loaded in the village street. There were scores of people, most of them sufficiently sabbatical to have assumed their best clothes. The soldiers were having the greatest difficulty in making them realize the gravity of their position. We saw one shriveled old fellow with a huge box and a score or more of flower pots containing orchids angrily expostulating with the corporal who would leave them behind. I stopped and gripped his arm. Do you know what's over there? I said, pointing at the pine tops that hid the Martians. Eh? said he, turning. I was explaining these is valuable. Death! I shouted. Death is coming! Death! And leaving him to digest that if he could, I hurried on after the artillery man. At the corner, I looked back. The soldier had left him, and he was still standing by his box with the pots of orchids on the lid of it and staring vaguely over the trees. No one in Weybridge could tell us where the headquarters were established. The whole place was in such confusion as I had never seen in any town before. Carts, carriages everywhere, the most astonishing miscellany of conveyances and horse flesh. The respectable inhabitants of the place, men in golf and boating costumes, wives prettily dressed, were packing, riverside loafers energetically helping, children excited, and for the most part, highly delighted at this astonishing variation of their Sunday experiences. In the midst of it all, the worthy vicar was very pluckily holding an early celebration, and his bell was jangling out above the excitement. I and the artilleryman, seated on the step of the drinking fountain, made a very passable meal upon what we had brought with us. Patrols of soldiers, here no longer hussars but grenadiers in white, were warning people to move now or to take refuge in their cellars as soon as the firing began. We saw, as we crossed the railway bridge, that a growing crowd of people had assembled in and about the railway station, and the swarming platform was piled with boxes and packages. The ordinary traffic had been stopped, I believe, in order to allow of the passage of troops and guns to Chertsey and I have heard since that a savage struggle occurred for places in the special trains that were put on at a later hour. We remained at Weybridge until midday, and at that hour we found ourselves at the place near Shepperton Lock, where the Way and Thames join. Part of the time we spent helping two old women to pack a little cart. The Way has a treble mouth, and at this point boats are to be hired, and there was a ferry across the river. On the Shepperton side was an inn with a lawn, and beyond that, the tower of Shepperton Church, it has been replaced by a spire, rose above the trees. Here we found an excited and noisy crowd of fugitives. As yet, the flight had not grown to a panic, but there were already far more people than all the boats going to and fro could enable to cross. People came panting along under heavy burdens. One husband and wife were even carrying a small outhouse door between them, with some of their household goods piled thereon. One man told us he meant to try to get away from Shepperton Station. There was a lot of shouting, and one man was even jesting. The idea people seemed to have here was that the Martians were simply formidable human beings, who might attack and sack the town to be certainly destroyed in the end. Every now and then, people would glance nervously across the way at the meadows towards Chertsey, but everything over there was still. Across the Thames, except just where the boats landed, everything was quiet, in vivid contrast with the Surrey side. The people who landed there from the boats went tramping off down the lane. 
the big ferry boat had just made a journey. Three or four soldiers stood on the lawn of the inn, staring and jesting at the fugitives without offering to help. The inn was closed, as it was now within prohibited hours. What's that? cried a boatman. And shut up, you fool, said a man near me to a yelping dog. Then the sound came again, this time from the direction of Chertsey, a muffled thud, the sound of a gun. The fighting was beginning. Almost immediately unseen batteries across the river to our right, unseen because of the trees, took up the chorus, firing heavily one after the other. A woman screamed. Everyone stood arrested by the sudden stir of battle, near us, and yet invisible to us. Nothing was to be seen save flat meadows, cows feeding unconcernedly for the most part, and silvery pollard willows motionless in the warm sunlight. The soldiers will stop them, said a woman beside me doubtfully. A haziness rose over the treetops, then suddenly we saw a rush of smoke far away up the river, a puff of smoke that jerked up into the air and hung, and forthwith the ground heaved underfoot, and a heavy explosion shook the air, smashing two or three windows in the houses near and leaving us astonished. Here they are, shouted a man in a blue jersey. Yonder! Do you see them? Yonder! Quickly, one after the other, one, two, three, four of the armoured Martians appeared, far away over the little trees, across the flat meadows that stretched towards Chertsey and striding hurriedly towards the river. Little cowled figures they seemed at first, going with a rolling motion and as fast as flying birds. Then, advancing obliquely towards us, came a fifth. Their armoured bodies glittered in the sun as they swept swiftly forward upon the guns, growing rapidly larger as they drew nearer. One on the extreme left, the remotest that is, flourished a huge case high in the air, and the ghostly, terrible heat ray I had already seen on Friday night smote towards Chertsey and struck the town. At sight of these strange, swift, and terrible creatures, the crowd near the water's edge seemed to me to be for a moment horror-struck. There was no screaming or shouting, but a silence. Then a hoarse murmur and a movement of feet, a splashing from the water. A man, too frightened to drop the portmanteau he carried on his shoulder, swung round and sent me staggering with a blow from the corner of his burden. A woman thrust at me with her hand and rushed past me. I turned with the rush of the people, but I was not too terrified for thought. The terrible heat ray was in my mind. To get under water, that was it. Get under water, I shouted, unheeded. I faced about again and rushed towards the approaching Martian, rushed right down the gravelly beach and headlong into the water. Others did the same. A boatload of people putting back came leaping out as I rushed past. The stones under my feet were muddy and slippery, and the river was so low that I ran perhaps twenty feet scarcely waist-deep. Then, as the Martian towered overhead scarcely a couple of hundred yards away, I flung myself forward under the surface. The splashes of the people in the boats leaping into the river sounded like thunderclaps in my ears. People were landing hastily on both sides of the river. But the Martian machine took no more notice for the moment of the people running this way and that than a man would of the confusion of ants in a nest against which his foot has kicked. When, half suffocated, I raised my head above water, the Martian's hood pointed at the batteries that were still firing across the river, and as it advanced it swung loose what must have been the generator of the heat ray. In another moment it was on the bank, and in a stride wading halfway across, the knees of its foremost legs bent at the farther bank, and in another moment it had raised itself to its full height again, close to the village of Shepperton. Forthwith, the six guns, which, unknown to anyone on the right bank, had been hidden behind the outskirts of that village, fired simultaneously. The sudden near concussion, the last close upon the first, made my heart jump. The monster was already raising the case, generating the heat ray, as the first shell burst six yards above the hood. I gave a cry of astonishment. I saw and thought nothing of the other four Martian monsters. My attention was riveted upon the nearer incident. Simultaneously, 
Two other shells burst in the air near the body as the hood twisted round in time to receive, but not in time to dodge, the fourth shell. The shell burst clean in the face of the thing. The hood bulged, flashed, was whirled off in a dozen tattered fragments of red flesh and glittering metal. Hit! shouted I, with something between a scream and a cheer. I heard answering shouts from the people in the water about me. I could have leaped out of the water with that momentary exultation. The decapitated colossus reeled like a drunken giant, but it did not fall over. It recovered its balance by a miracle, and no longer heeding its steps, and with the camera that fired the heat ray now rigidly upheld, it reeled swiftly upon Shepperton. The living intelligence, the Martian within the hood, was slain and splashed to the four winds of heaven, and the thing was now but a mere intricate device of metal whirling to destruction. It drove along in a straight line, incapable of guidance. It struck the tower of Shepperton Church, smashing it down as the impact of a battering ram might have done, swerved aside, blundered on, and collapsed with tremendous force into the river out of my sight. A violent explosion shook the air, and a spout of water, steam, mud, and shattered metal shot far up into the sky. As the camera of the heat ray hit the water, the latter had immediately flashed into steam. In another moment, a huge wave, like a muddy tidal bore but almost scaldingly hot, came sweeping round the bend upstream. I saw people struggling shorewards, and heard their screaming and shouting faintly above the seething and roar of the Martian's collapse. For a moment I heeded nothing of the heat, forgot the patent need of self-preservation. I splashed through the tumultuous water, pushing aside a man in black to do so, until I could see round the bend. Half a dozen deserted boats pitched aimlessly upon the confusion of the waves, the fallen Martian came into sight downstream, lying across the river, and for the most part, submerged. Thick clouds of steam were pouring off the wreckage, and through the tumultuously whirling wisps I could see, intermittently and vaguely, the gigantic limbs churning the water and flinging a splash and spray of mud and froth into the air. The tentacles swayed and struck like living arms, and save for the helpless purposelessness of these movements, it was as if some wounded thing were struggling for its life amid the waves. Enormous quantities of a ruddy brown fluid were spurting up in noisy jets out of the machine. My attention was diverted from this death flurry by a furious yelling, like that of the thing called a siren in our manufacturing towns. A man, knee-deep near the towing path, shouted inaudibly to me and pointed. Looking back, I saw the other Martians advancing with gigantic strides down the riverbank from the direction of Chertsey. The Shepperton guns spoke this time unavailingly. At that, I ducked at once under water, and holding my breath until movement was an agony, blundered painfully ahead under the surface as long as I could. The water was in a tumult about me, and rapidly growing hotter. When for a moment I raised my head to take breath and throw the hair and water from my eyes, the steam was rising in a whirling white fog that at first hid the Martians altogether. The noise was deafening. Then I saw them dimly colossal figures of grey, magnified by the mist. They had passed by me, and two were stooping over the frothing, tumultuous ruins of their comrade. The third and fourth stood beside him in the water one perhaps two hundred yards from me, the other towards Lelaham. The generators of the heat rays waved high, and the hissing beams smote down this way and that. The air was full of sound, a deafening and confusing conflict of noises. The clangorous din of the Martians, the crash of falling houses, the thud of trees, fences, sheds, flashing into flame, and the crackling and roaring of fire. Dense black smoke was leaping up to mingle with the steam from the river, and as the heat ray went to and fro over Weybridge, its impact was marked by flashes of incandescent white that gave place at once to a smoky dance of lurid flames. The nearer houses still stood intact, awaiting their fate, shadowy, faint and pallid in the steam, with the fire behind them going to and fro. For a moment perhaps I stood there, breast high in the almost boiling water, dumbfounded at my position. 
hopeless of escape. Through the reek I could see the people who had been with me in the river, scrambling out of the water through the reeds, like little frogs hurrying through grass from the advance of a man, or running to and fro in utter dismay on the towing path. Then suddenly the white flashes of the heat ray came leaping towards me. The houses caved in as they dissolved at its touch and darted out flames. The trees changed to fire with a roar. The ray flickered up and down the towing path, licking off the people who ran this way and that, and came down to the water's edge, not fifty yards from where I stood. It swept across the river to Shepperton, and the water in its track rose in a boiling wheel crested with steam. I turned shoreward. In another moment, the huge wave, well nigh at the boiling point, had rushed upon me. I screamed aloud and scalded, half-blinded, agonized. I staggered through the leaping, hissing water towards the shore. Had my foot stumbled, it would have been the end. I fell helplessly, in full sight of the Martians, upon the broad, bare, gravelly spit that runs down to mark the angle of the way in Thames. I expected nothing but death. I have a dim memory of the foot of a Martian coming down within a score of yards of my head, driving straight into the loose gravel, whirling it this way and that, and lifting again, of a long suspense, and then of the four carrying the debris of their comrade between them, now clear and then presently faint through a veil of smoke, receding interminably, as it seemed to me, across a vast space of river and meadow. And then, very slowly, I realized that by a miracle I had escaped. Chapter 13 How I Fell In With The Curate After getting this sudden lesson in the power of terrestrial weapons, the Martians retreated to their original position upon Horsell Common, and in their haste, and encumbered with the debris of their smashed companion, they no doubt overlooked many such a stray and negligible victim as myself. Had they left their comrade and pushed on forthwith, there was nothing at that time between them and London but batteries of twelve-pounder guns, and they would certainly have reached the capital in advance of the tidings of their approach. As sudden, dreadful, and destructive their advent would have been as the earthquake that destroyed Lisbon a century ago. But they were in no hurry. Cylinder followed Cylinder on its interplanetary flight. Every twenty-four hours brought them reinforcement and meanwhile the military and naval authorities, now fully alive to the tremendous power of their antagonists, worked with furious energy. Every minute a fresh gun came into position, until before twilight, every copse, every row of suburban villas on the hilly slopes about Kingston and Richmond masked an expectant black muzzle, and through the charred and desolated area, perhaps twenty square miles altogether, that encircled the Martian encampment on Horsell Common, through charred and ruined villages among the green trees, through the blackened and smoking arcades that had been but a day ago, pine spinneys, crawled the devoted scouts with the heliographs that were presently to warn the gunners of the Martian approach. But the Martians now understood our command of artillery and the danger of human proximity, and not a man ventured within a mile of either cylinder, save at the price of his life. It would seem that these giants spent the earlier part of the afternoon in going to and fro, transferring everything from the second and third cylinders, the second in Adelstone Golf Links and the third at Pierford, to their original pit on Horsell Common. Over that, above the blackened heather and ruined buildings that stretched far and wide, stood one as sentinel, while the rest abandoned their vast fighting machines and descended into the pit. They were hard at work there far into the night, and the towering pillar of dense green smoke that rose therefrom could be seen from the hills about Merrow, and even, it is said, from Banstead and Epsom Downs. And while the Martians behind me were thus preparing for their next sally, and in front of me humanity gathered for the battle, I made my way with infinite pains and labour from the fire and smoke of burning Weybridge towards London. I saw an abandoned boat, very small and remote, drifting downstream, and throwing off the most of my sodden clothes, I went after it, gained it, and so escaped out of that destruction. 
There were no oars in the boat, but I contrived to paddle, as well as my parboiled hands would allow, down the river towards Halliford and Walton, going very tediously and continually looking behind me, as you may well understand. I followed the river, because I considered that the water gave me my best chance of escape should these giants return. The hot water from the Martians' overthrow drifted downstream with me, so that for the best part of a mile I could see little of either bank. Once, however, I made out a string of black figures hurrying across the meadows from the direction of Weybridge. Halliford, it seemed, was deserted, and several of the houses facing the river were on fire. It was strange to see the place quite tranquil, quite desolate under the hot blue sky, with the smoke and little threads of flame going straight up into the heat of the afternoon. Never before had I seen houses burning without the accompaniment of an obstructive crowd. A little farther on the dry reeds up the bank were smoking and glowing, and a line of fire inland was marching steadily across a late field of hay. For a long time I drifted, so painful and weary was I after the violence I had been through, and so intense the heat upon the water. Then my fears got the better of me again, and I resumed my paddling. The sun scorched my bare back. At last, as the bridge at Walton was coming into sight round the bend, my fever and faintness overcame my fears, and I landed on the Middlesex bank and lay down, deadly sick, amid the long grass. I suppose the time was then about four or five o'clock, I got up presently, walked perhaps half a mile without meeting a soul, and then lay down again in the shadow of a hedge. I seem to remember talking wanderingly to myself during that last spurt. I was also very thirsty and bitterly regretful I had drunk no more water. It is a curious thing that I felt angry with my wife. I cannot account for it, but my impotent desire to reach Leatherhead worried me excessively. I do not clearly remember the arrival of the curate, so that probably I dozed. I became aware of him as a seated figure in soot-smudged shirt-sleeves, and with his upturned, clean-shaven face staring at a faint flickering that danced over the sky. The sky was what is called a mackerel sky, rows and rows of faint down plumes of cloud, just tinted with the midsummer sunset. I sat up, and at the rustle of my motion he looked at me quickly. "'Have you any water?' I asked abruptly. He shook his head. "'You have been asking for water for the last hour,' he said. For a moment we were silent, taking stock of each other. I dare say he found me a strange enough figure, naked, save for my water-soaked trousers and socks, scalded, and my face and shoulders blackened by the smoke. His face was a fair weakness, his chin retreated, and his hair lay in crisp, almost flaxen curls on his low forehead. His eyes were rather large, pale blue, and blankly staring. He spoke abruptly, looking vacantly away from me. What does it mean? he said. What do these things mean? I stared at him and made no answer. He extended a thin white hand and spoke in almost a complaining tone. Why are these things permitted? What sins have we done? The morning service was over. I was walking through the roads to clear my brain for the afternoon, and then fire, earthquake, death, as if it were Sodom and Gomorrah, all our work undone, all the work. What are these Martians? What are we? I answered, clearing my throat. He gripped his knees and turned to look at me again. For half a minute, perhaps, he stared silently. I was walking through the roads to clear my brain, he said, and suddenly, Fire, earthquake, death. He relapsed into silence, with his chin now sunken almost to his knees. Presently he began waving his hand. All the work, all the Sunday schools. What have we done? What has Weybridge done? Everything gone, everything destroyed. The church. We rebuilt it only three years ago. Gone, swept out of existence. Why? Another pause and he broke out again like one demented. The smoke of her burning goeth up for ever and ever, he shouted. His eyes flamed, and he pointed a lean finger in the direction of Weybridge. By this time I was beginning to take his measure. 
The tremendous tragedy in which he had been involved, it was evident he was a fugitive from Weybridge, had driven him to the very verge of his reason. Are we far from Sunbury? I said in a matter-of-fact tone. What are we to do? he asked. Are these creatures everywhere? Has the earth been given over to them? Are we far from Sunbury? Only this morning I officiated at early celebration. Things have changed, I said quietly. You must keep your head. There is still hope. Hope? Yes, plentiful hope for all this destruction. I began to explain my view of our position. He listened at first, but as I went on the interest dawning in his eyes gave place to their former stare, and his regard wandered from me. This must be the beginning of the end, he said, interrupting me. The end, the great and terrible day of the Lord, when men shall call upon the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them and hide them, hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. I began to understand the position. I ceased my laboured reasoning, struggled to my feet, and standing over him, laid my hand on his shoulder. Be a man, said I. You are scared out of your wits. What good is religion if it collapses under calamity? Think of what earthquakes and floods, wars and volcanoes have done before to men. Did you think God had exempted Weybridge? He is not an insurance agent. For a time he sat in blank silence. But how can we escape? he asked suddenly. They are invulnerable. They are pitiless. Neither the one nor perhaps the other, I answered and the mightier they are, the more sane and wary should we be. One of them was killed yonder not three hours ago. Killed, he said, staring about him. How can God's ministers be killed? I saw it happen. I proceeded to tell him. We have chanced to come in for the thick of it, said I, and that is all. What is that flicker in the sky? he asked abruptly. I told him it was the heliograph signalling that it was the sign of human help and effort in the sky. We are in the midst of it, I said, quiet as it is. That flicker in the sky tells of the gathering storm. Yonder, I take it, are the Martians and Londonwood, where those hills rise about Richmond and Kingston, and the trees give cover. Earthworks are being thrown up, and guns are being placed. Presently, the Martians will be coming this way again. And even as I spoke, he sprang to his feet and stopped me by a gesture. Listen, he said. From beyond the low hills across the water came the dull resonance of distant guns and a remote, weird crying. Then everything was still. A cockchafer came droning over the hedge and past us. High in the west, the crescent moon hung faint and pale above the smoke of Weybridge and Shepperton and the hot, still splendor of the sunset. We had better follow this path, I said, northward. Chapter 14 In London My younger brother was in London when the Martians fell at Woking. He was a medical student working for an imminent examination, and he heard nothing of the arrival until Saturday morning. The morning papers on Saturday contained, in addition to lengthy special articles on the planet Mars, on life in the planets and so forth, a brief and vaguely worded telegram, all the more striking for its brevity. The Martians, alarmed by the approach of a crowd, had killed a number of people with a quick-firing gun, so the story ran. The telegram concluded with the words, Formidable as they seem to be, the Martians have not moved from the pit into which they have fallen, and indeed seem incapable of doing so. Probably this is due to the relative strength of the Earth's gravitational energy. On that last text, their leader writer expanded very comfortingly. Of course, all the students in the Crammer's biology class, to which my brother went that day, were intensely interested, but there were no signs of any unusual excitement in the streets. The afternoon papers puffed scraps of news under big headlines, they had nothing to tell beyond the movements of troops about the common and the burning of the pine woods between Woking and Weybridge until eight. Then the St. James's Gazette, in an extra special edition, announced the bare fact of the interruption of telegraphic communication. This was thought to be due to the falling of burning pine trees across the line. 
Nothing more of the fighting was known that night, the night of my drive to Leatherhead and back. My brother felt no anxiety about us, as he knew from the description in the papers that the cylinder was a good two miles from my house. He made up his mind to run down that night to me, in order, as he says, to see the things before they were killed. He dispatched a telegram, which never reached me about four o'clock, and spent the evening at a music hall. In London also, on Saturday night, there was a thunderstorm, and my brother reached Waterloo in a cab. On the platform from which the midnight train usually starts, he learned, after some waiting, that an accident prevented trains from reaching Woking that night. The nature of the accident he could not ascertain. Indeed, the railway authorities did not clearly know at that time. There was very little excitement in the station, as the officials, failing to realize that anything further than a breakdown between Byfleet and Woking Junction had occurred, were running the theatre trains, which usually passed through Woking Round by Virginia Water or Guildford. They were busy making the necessary arrangements to alter the route of the Southampton and Portsmouth Sunday League excursions. A nocturnal newspaper reporter, mistaking my brother for the traffic manager, to whom he bears a slight resemblance, waylaid and tried to interview him. Few people, excepting the railway officials, connected the breakdown with the Martians. I have read, in another account of these events, that on Sunday morning, all London was electrified by the news from Woking. As a matter of fact, there was nothing to justify that very extravagant phrase. Plenty of Londoners did not hear of the Martians until the panic of Monday morning. Those who did took some time to realize all that the hastily worded telegrams in the Sunday papers conveyed. The majority of people in London do not read Sunday papers. The habit of personal security, moreover, is so deeply fixed in the Londoner's mind, and startling intelligence so much a matter of course in the papers, that they could read without any personal tremors. About seven o'clock last night, the Martians came out of the cylinder, and moving about under an armour of metallic shields, have completely wrecked Woking Station with the adjacent houses, and massacred an entire battalion of the Cardigan Regiment. No details are known. Maxims have been absolutely useless against their armour. The field guns have been disabled by them. Flying hussars have been galloping into Chertsey. The Martians appear to be moving slowly towards Chertsey or Windsor, Great anxiety prevails in West Surrey, and earthworks are being thrown up to check the advance Londonward. That was how the Sunday Sunder put it, and a clever and remarkably prompt handbook article in the referee compared the affair to a menagerie suddenly let loose in a village. No one in London knew positively of the nature of the armoured Martians, and there was still a fixed idea that these monsters must be sluggish, crawling, creeping painfully, such expressions occurred in almost all the earlier reports. None of the telegrams could have been written by an eyewitness of their advance. The Sunday papers printed separate editions as further news came to hand, some even in default of it. But there was practically nothing more to tell people until late in the afternoon, when the authorities gave the press agencies the news in their possession. It was stated that the people of Walton and Weybridge and all the district were pouring along the roads Londonward. And that was all. My brother went to church at the Foundling Hospital in the morning, still in ignorance of what had happened on the previous night. There, he heard allusions made to the invasion and a special prayer for peace. Coming out, he bought a referee. He became alarmed at the news in this and went again to Waterloo Station to find out if communication were restored. The omnibuses, Carriages, cyclists, and innumerable people walking in their best clothes seemed scarcely affected by the strange intelligence that the news vendors were disseminating. People were interested, or if alarmed, alarmed only on account of the local residents. At the station, he heard for the first time that the Windsor and Chertsey lines were now interrupted. The porters told him that several remarkable telegrams had been received in the morning from Byfleet and Chertsey stations but that these had abruptly ceased. My brother could get very little precise detail out of them. There's fighting going on about Weybridge was the extent of their information. The train service was now very much disorganized. Quite a number of people who had been expecting friends from places on the southwestern network were standing about the station. 
One grey-headed old gentleman came and abused the Southwestern Company bitterly to my brother. It wants showing up, he said. One or two trains came in from Richmond, Putney and Kingston, containing people who had gone out for a day's boating and found the locks closed and a feeling of panic in the air. A man in a blue and white blazer addressed my brother, full of strange tidings. There's hosts of people driving into Kingston in traps and carts and things, with boxes of valuables and all that, he said. They come from Molsey and Weybridge and Walton, and they say there's been guns heard at Chertsey, heavy firing, and that mounted soldiers have told them to get off at once because the Martians are coming. We heard guns firing at Hampton Court Station, but we thought it was thunder. What the dickens does it all mean? The Martians can't get out of their pit, can they? My brother could not tell him. Afterwards, he found that the vague feeling of alarm had spread to the clients of the Underground Railway, and that the Sunday excursionists began to return from all over the southwestern Lung, Barnes, Wimbledon, Richmond Park, Kew, and so forth, at unnaturally early hours. But not a soul had anything more than vague hearsay to tell of. Everyone connected with the terminus seemed ill-tempered. About five o'clock, the gathering crowd in the station was immensely excited by the opening of the line of communication, which is almost invariably closed, between the southeastern and the southwestern stations, and the passage of carriage trucks bearing huge guns and carriages crammed with soldiers. These were the guns that were brought up from Woolwich and Chatham to cover Kingston. There was an exchange of pleasantries. You'll get eaten. We're the beast tamers, and so forth. A little while after that, a squad of police came into the station and began to clear the public off the platforms, and my brother went out into the street again. The church bells were ringing for evensong, and a squad of Salvation Army lassies came singing down Waterloo Road. On the bridge, a number of loafers were watching a curious brown scum that came drifting down the stream in patches. The sun was just setting, and the clock tower and the Houses of Parliament rose against one of the most peaceful skies it is possible to imagine. A sky of gold, barred with long transverse stripes of reddish-purple cloud. There was talk of a floating body. One of the men there, a reservist he said he was, told my brother he had seen the heliograph flickering in the west. In Wellington Street, my brother met a couple of sturdy roughs who had just been rushed out of Fleet Street with still wet newspapers and staring placards. Dreadful catastrophe, they bawled one to the other down Wellington Street. Fighting at Weybridge, full description, repulse of the Martians, London in danger. He had to give threepence for a copy of that paper. Then it was, and then only, that he realized something of the full power and terror of these monsters. He learned that they were not merely a handful of small, sluggish creatures, but that they were minds swaying vast mechanical bodies, and that they could move swiftly and smite with such power that even the mightiest guns could not stand against them. They were described as vast, spider-like machines nearly a hundred feet high, capable of the speed of an express train and able to shoot out a beam of intense heat. Masked batteries, chiefly of field guns, had been planted in the country about Horsell Common and especially between the Woking District and London. Five of the machines had been seen moving towards the Thames and one, by a happy chance, had been destroyed. In the other cases, the shells had missed and the batteries had been at once annihilated by the heat rays. Heavy losses of soldiers were mentioned, but the tone of the dispatch was optimistic. The Martians had been repulsed. They were not invulnerable. They had retreated to their triangle of cylinders again, in the circle about Woking. Signalers with heliographs were pushing forward upon them from all sides. Guns were in rapid transit from Windsor, Portsmouth, Aldershot, Woolwich, even from the north, among others, long wire guns of 95 tons from Woolwich. Altogether, 116 were in position or being hastily placed, chiefly covering London. Never before in England had there been such a vast or rapid concentration of military material. Any further cylinders that fell, it was hoped, could be destroyed at once by high explosives, which were being rapidly manufactured and distributed. No doubt ran the report, 
The situation was of the strangest and gravest description, but the public was exhorted to avoid and discourage panic. No doubt the Martians were strange and terrible in the extreme, but at the outside there could not be more than twenty of them against our millions. The authorities had reason to suppose, from the size of the cylinders, that at the outside there could not be more than five in each cylinder, fifteen altogether, and one at least was disposed of, perhaps more. The public would be fairly warned of the approach of danger, and elaborate measures were being taken for the protection of the people in the threatened southwestern suburbs. And so, with reiterated assurances of the safety of London and the ability of the authorities to cope with the difficulty, this quasi-proclamation closed. This was printed in enormous type on paper so fresh that it was still wet, and there had been no time to add a word of comment. It was curious, my brother said, to see how ruthlessly the usual contents of the paper had been hacked and taken out to give this place. All down Wellington Street, people could be seen fluttering out the pink sheets and reading, and the Strand was suddenly noisy with the voices of an army of hawkers following these pioneers. Men came scrambling off buses to secure copies. Certainly this news excited people intensely, whatever their previous apathy. The shutters of a map shop in the Strand were being taken down, my brother said, and a man in his Sunday raiment lemon-yellow gloves even, was visible inside the window, hastily fastening maps of Surrey to the glass. Going on along the Strand to Trafalgar Square, the paper in his hand, my brother saw some of the fugitives from West Surrey. There was a man with his wife and two boys, and some articles of furniture in a cart such as greengrocers use. He was driving from the direction of Westminster Bridge, and close behind him came a hay wagon with five or six respectable-looking people in it and some boxes and bundles. The faces of these people were haggard, and their entire appearance contrasted conspicuously with the Sabbath-best appearance of the people on the omnibuses. People in fashionable clothing peeped at them out of cabs. They stopped at the square as if undecided which way to take, and finally turned eastward along the Strand. Some way behind these came a man in workday clothes, riding one of those old-fashioned tricycles with a small front wheel. He was dirty and white in the face. My brother turned down towards Victoria and met a number of such people. He had a vague idea that he might see something of me. He noticed an unusual number of police regulating the traffic. Some of the refugees were exchanging news with the people on the omnibuses. One was professing to have seen the Martians. Boilers on stilts, I tell you, striding along like men. Most of them were excited and animated by their strange experience. Beyond Victoria, the public houses were doing a lively trade with these arrivals. At all the street corners, groups of people were reading papers, talking excitedly, or staring at these unusual Sunday visitors. They seemed to increase as night drew on, until at last the roads, my brother said, were like Epsom High Street on a derby day. My brother addressed several of these fugitives and got unsatisfactory answers from most. None of them could tell him any news of Woking except one man who assured him that Woking had been entirely destroyed on the previous night. I come from Byfleet, he said. A man on a bicycle came through the place in the early morning and ran from door to door, warning us to come away. Then came soldiers. We went out to look, and there were clouds of smoke to the south, nothing but smoke, and not a soul coming that way. Then we heard the guns at Chertsey, and folks coming from Weybridge. So I've locked up my house and come on. At that time, there was a strong feeling in the streets that the authorities were to blame for their incapacity to dispose of the invaders without all this inconvenience. About eight o'clock, a noise of heavy firing was distinctly audible all over the south of London. My brother could not hear it for the traffic in the main thoroughfares, but by striking through the quiet back streets to the river, he was able to distinguish it quite plainly. He walked from Westminster to his apartments near Regent's Park, about two. He was now very anxious on my account, and disturbed at the evident magnitude of the trouble. His mind was inclined to run, even as mine had run on Saturday on military details. He thought of all those silent, expectant guns of the suddenly nomadic countryside. 
He tried to imagine boilers on stilts a hundred feet high. There were one or two cartloads of refugees passing along Oxford Street and several in the Marylebone Road. But so slowly was the news spreading that Regent Street and Portland Place were full of their usual Sunday night promenaders, albeit they talked in groups, and along the edge of Regent's Park there were as many silent couples walking out together under the scattered gas lamps as ever there had been. The night was warm and still and a little oppressive. The sound of guns continued intermittently and after midnight there seemed to be sheet lightning in the south. He read and reread the paper, fearing the worst had happened to me. He was restless and after supper prowled out again aimlessly. He returned and tried in vain to divert his attention to his examination notes. He went to bed a little after midnight and was awakened from lurid dreams in the small hours of Monday by the sound of door knockers, feet running in the street, distant drumming, and a clamor of bells. Red reflections danced on the ceiling. For a moment he lay astonished, wondering whether day had come or the world gone mad. Then he jumped out of bed and ran to the window. His room was an attic, and as he thrust his head out, up and down the street, there were a dozen echoes to the noise of his window sash, and heads in every kind of night disarray appeared. Inquiries were being shouted. They are coming! bawled a policeman, hammering at the door. The Martians are coming! and hurried to the next door. The sound of drumming and trumpeting came from the Albany Street barracks, and every church within earshot was hard at work, killing sleep with a vehement, disorderly toxin. There was a noise of doors opening, and window after window in the houses opposite flashed from darkness into yellow illumination. Up the street came galloping a closed carriage, bursting abruptly into noise at the corner, rising to a clattering climax under the window, and dying away slowly in the distance. Close on the rear of this came a couple of cabs, the forerunners of a long procession of flying vehicles, going for the most part to Chalk Farm Station, where the Northwestern special trains were loading up, instead of coming down the gradient into Euston. For a long time, my brother stared out of the window in blank astonishment, watching the policemen hammering at door after door and delivering their incomprehensible message. Then the door behind him opened, and the man who lodged across the landing came in, dressed only in shirt, trousers and slippers, his braces loose about his waist, his hair disordered from his pillow. "'What the devil is it?' he asked. "'A fire? What a devil of a row!' They both craned their heads out of the window, straining to hear what the policemen were shouting. People were coming out of the side streets and standing in groups at the corners talking. "'What the devil is it all about?' said my brother's fellow lodger. My brother answered him vaguely and began to dress, running with each garment to the window in order to miss nothing of the growing excitement. And presently, men selling unnaturally early newspapers came bawling into the street. "'London in danger of suffocation. The Kingston and Richmond defences forced. Fearful massacres in the Thames Valley.' And all about him, in the rooms below, in the houses on each side and across the road, and behind in the park terraces and in the hundred other streets of that part of Marylebone, and the Westbourne Park District and St Pancras, and westward and northward in Kilburn and St John's Wood and Hampstead, and eastward in Shoreditch and Highbury and Haggerston and Hoxton, and, indeed, through all the vastness of London from Ealing to East Ham, people were rubbing their eyes and opening windows to stare out and ask aimless questions, dressing hastily as the first breath of the coming storm of fear blew through the streets. It was the dawn of the Great Panic. London, which had gone to bed on Sunday night, oblivious and inert, was awakened in the small hours of Monday morning to a vivid sense of danger. Unable from his window to learn what was happening, my brother went down and out into the street, just as the sky between the parapets of the houses grew pink with the early dawn. The flying people on foot and in vehicles grew more numerous every moment. Black smoke, he heard people crying, and again, black smoke. The contagion of such a unanimous fear was inevitable. As my brother hesitated on the doorstep, 
he saw another news vendor approaching and got a paper forthwith. The man was running away with the rest and selling his papers for a shilling each as he ran, a grotesque mingling of profit and panic. And from this paper my brother read that catastrophic dispatch of the commander-in-chief. The Martians are able to discharge enormous clouds of a black and poisonous vapor by means of rockets. They have smothered our batteries, destroyed Richmond, Kingston and Wimbledon, and are advancing slowly towards London, destroying everything on the way. It is impossible to stop them. There is no safety from the black smoke, but in instant flight. That was all, but it was enough. The whole population of the great six million city was stirring, slipping, running. Presently, it would be pouring en masse northward. Black smoke! the voices cried. Fire! The bells of the neighbouring church made a jangling tumult, a cart carelessly driven smashed amid shrieks and curses against the water trough up the street. Sickly yellow lights went to and fro in the houses, and some of the passing cabs flaunted unextinguished lamps, and overhead the dawn was growing brighter, clear and steady and calm. He heard footsteps running to and fro in the rooms and up and down stairs behind him. His landlady came to the door, loosely wrapped in dressing gown and shawl. Her husband followed, ejaculating. As my brother began to realize the import of all these things, he turned hastily to his own room, put all his available money, some ten pounds altogether, into his pockets and went out again into the streets. Chapter 15 what happened in Surrey? It was while the curate had sat and talked so wildly to me under the hedge in the flat meadows near Halliford, and while my brother was watching the fugitive stream over Westminster Bridge, that the Martians had resumed the offensive. So far as one can ascertain from the conflicting accounts that have been put forth, the majority of them remained busied with preparations in the horsehell pit until nine that night hurrying on some operation that disengaged huge volumes of green smoke. But three certainly came out about eight o'clock, and advancing slowly and cautiously, made their way through Byfleet and Pilford towards Ripley and Weybridge, and so came in sight of the expectant batteries against the setting sun. These Martians did not advance in a body, but in a line, each perhaps a mile and a half from his nearest fellow. They communicated with one another by means of siren-like howls running up and down the scale from one note to another. It was this howling and firing of the guns at Ripley and St. George's Hill that we had heard at Upper Halliford. The Ripley gunners, unseasoned artillery volunteers who ought never to have been placed in such a position, fired one wild, premature, ineffectual volley and bolted on horse and foot through the deserted village while the Martian, without using his heat ray, walked serenely over their guns, stepped gingerly among them, passed in front of them, and so came unexpectedly upon the guns in Painshill Park, which he destroyed. The St. George's Hill men, however, were better led, or of a better metal. Hidden by a pine wood as they were, they seemed to have been quite unsuspected by the Martian nearest to them. They laid their guns as deliberately as if they had been on parade, and fired at about a thousand yards' range. The shells flashed all round him, and he was seen to advance a few paces, stagger, and go down. Everybody yelled together, and the guns were reloaded in frantic haste. The overthrown Martian set up a prolonged ululation, and immediately a second glittering giant, answering him, appeared over the trees to the south. It would seem that a leg of the tripod had been smashed by one of the shells. The whole of the second volley flew wide of the Martian on the ground, and simultaneously both his companions brought their heat rays to bear on the battery. The ammunition blew up, the pine trees all about the guns flashed into fire, and only one or two of the men who were already running over the crest of the hill escaped. After this, it would seem that the three took counsel together and halted, and the scouts who were watching them report that they remained absolutely stationary for the next half hour. The Martian who had been overthrown crawled tediously out of his hood, a small brown figure, oddly suggestive from that distance of a speck of blight, and apparently engaged in the repair of his support. About nine he had finished, for his cow was then seen above the trees again. 
It was a few minutes past nine that night when these three sentinels were joined by four other Martians, each carrying a thick black tube. A similar tube was handed to each of the three, and the seven proceeded to distribute themselves at equal distances along a curved line between St. George's Hill, Weybridge, and the village of Send, southwest of Ripley. A dozen rockets sprang out of the hills before them so soon as they began to move, and warned the waiting batteries about Ditton and Escher. At the same time, four of their fighting machines, similarly armed with tubes, crossed the river, and two of them, black against the western sky, came into sight of myself and the curate as we hurried wearily and painfully along the road that runs northward out of Halliford. They moved, as it seemed to us, upon a cloud, for a milky mist covered the fields and rose to a third of their height. At this sight, the curate cried faintly in his throat and began running, but I knew it was no good running from a Martian, and I turned aside and crawled through dewy nettles and brambles into the broad ditch by the side of the road. He looked back, saw what I was doing, and turned to join me. The two halted, the nearer to us standing and facing Sunbury, the remoter being a grey indistinctness towards the evening star, away towards Staines. The occasional howling of the Martians had ceased. They took up their positions in the huge crescent about their cylinders in absolute silence. It was a crescent with twelve miles between its horns. Never since the devising of gunpowder was the beginning of a battle so still. To us, and to an observer about Ripley, it would have had precisely the same effect. The Martians seemed in solitary possession of the darkling night, lit only as it was by the slender moon, the stars, the afterglow of the daylight, and the ruddy glare from St. George's Hill and the woods of Painshill. But facing that crescent everywhere, at Staines, Hounslow, Ditton, Escher, Ockham, behind hills and woods south of the river, and across the flat grass meadows to the north of it, wherever a cluster of trees or village houses gave sufficient cover, the guns were waiting. The signal rockets burst and rained their sparks through the night and vanished, and the spirit of all those watching batteries rose to a tense expectation. The Martians had but to advance into the line of fire, and instantly those motionless black forms of men, those guns glittering so darkly in the early night, would explode into a thunderous fury of battle. No doubt the thought that was uppermost in a thousand of those vigilant minds, even as it was uppermost in mine, was the riddle, how much they understood of us. Did they grasp that we in our millions were organized, disciplined, working together? Or did they interpret our spurts of fire, the sudden stinging of our shells, our steady investment of their encampment, as we should the furious unanimity of onslaught in a disturbed hive of bees? Did they dream they might exterminate us? At that time, no one knew what food they needed. A hundred such questions struggled together in my mind as I watched that vast sentinel shape, and in the back of my mind was the sense of all the huge, unknown, and hidden forces Londonward. Had they prepared pitfalls? Were the powder mills at Hounslow ready as a snare? Would the Londoners have the heart and courage to make a greater Moscow of their mighty province of houses? Then, after an interminable time, as it seemed to us, crouching and peering through the hedge, came a sound like the distant concussion of a gun, another, nearer, and then another. And then the Martian beside us raised his tube on high and discharged it, gun-wise, with a heavy report that made the ground heave. The one towards Staines answered him. There was no flash, no smoke, simply that loaded detonation. I was so excited by these heavy minute guns following one another that I so far forgot my personal safety and my scalded hands as to clamber up into the hedge and stare towards Sunbury. As I did so, a second report followed, and a big projectile hurtled overhead towards Hounslow. I expected at least to see smoke or fire or some such evidence of its work. But all I saw was the deep blue sky above, with one solitary star, and the white mist spreading wide and low beneath. And there had been no crash, no answering explosion. The silence was restored, the minute lengthened to three. 
What has happened? said the curate, standing up beside me. Heaven knows, said I. A bat flickered by and vanished. A distant tumult of shouting began and ceased. I looked again at the Martian and saw he was now moving eastward along the riverbank with a swift, rolling motion. Every moment I expected the fire of some hidden battery to spring upon him, but the evening calm was unbroken. The figure of the Martian grew smaller as he receded, and presently the mist and the gathering night had swallowed him up. By a common impulse, we clambered higher. Towards Sunbury was a dark appearance, as though a conical hill had suddenly come into being there, hiding our view of the farther country. And then, remoter across the river, over Walton, we saw another such summit. These hill-like forms grew lower and broader, even as we stared. Moved by a sudden thought, I looked northward, and there I perceived a third of these cloudy black copjes had risen. Everything had suddenly become very still. Far away to the southeast, marking the quiet, we heard the Martians hooting to one another, and then the air quivered again with the distant thud of their guns. But the earthly artillery made no reply. Now, at the time, we could not understand these things, but later I was to learn the meaning of these ominous copjes that gathered in the twilight. Each of the Martians, standing in the great crescent I have described, had discharged, by means of the gun-like tube he carried, a huge canister over whatever hill, copse, cluster of houses, or other possible cover for guns, chanced to be in front of him. Some fired only one of these, some two, as in the case of the one we had seen. The one at Ripley is said to have discharged no fewer than five at that time. These canisters smashed on, striking the ground. They did not explode, and incontinently disengaged an enormous volume of heavy, inky vapor, coiling and pouring upward in a huge and ebony cumulus cloud, a gaseous hill that sank and spread itself slowly over the surrounding country. And the touch of that vapor, the inhaling of its pungent wisps, was death to all that breathes. It was heavy, this vapor, heavier than the densest smoke, so that after the first tumultuous uprush and outflow of its impact, it sank down through the air and poured over the ground in a manner rather liquid than gaseous, abandoning the hills and streaming into the valleys and ditches and watercourses, even as I have heard the carbonic acid gas that pours from volcanic clefts is wont to do. And where it came upon water, some chemical action occurred, and the surface would be instantly covered with a powdery scum that sank slowly and made way for more. The scum was absolutely insoluble, and it is a strange thing, seeing the instant effect of the gas, that one could drink without hurt the water from which it had been strained. The vapour did not diffuse as a true gas would do. It hung together in banks, flowing sluggishly down the slope of the land and driving reluctantly before the wind and very slowly it combined with the mist and moisture of the air and sank to the earth in the form of dust. Save that an unknown element giving a group of four lines in the blue of the spectrum is concerned, we are still entirely ignorant of the nature of this substance. Once the tumultuous upheaval of its dispersion was over, the black smoke clung so closely to the ground, even before its precipitation, that fifty feet up in the air, on the roofs and upper stories of high houses and on great trees, there was a chance of escaping its poison altogether, as was proved even that night at Street, Cobham and Ditton. The man who escaped at the former place tells a wonderful story of the strangeness of its coiling flow, and how he looked down from the church spire and saw the houses of the village rising like ghosts out of its inky nothingness. For a day and a half he remained there, weary, starving and sun-scorched, the earth under the blue sky and against the prospect of the distant hills a velvet black expanse with red roofs, green trees and later black-veiled shrubs and gates, barns, outhouses and walls rising here and there into the sunlight. But that was at Street Cobham where the black vapour was allowed to remain until it sank of its own accord into the ground. As a rule, the Martians, when it had served its purpose, 
cleared the air of it again by wading into it and directing a jet of steam upon it. This they did with the vapour banks near us, as we saw in the starlight from the window of a deserted house at Upper Halliford, whither we had returned. From there we could see the searchlights on Richmond Hill and Kingston Hill going to and fro, and about eleven the windows rattled, and we heard the sound of the huge siege guns that had been put in position there. These continued intermittently for the space of a quarter of an hour, sending chance shots at the invisible Martians at Hampton and Ditton, and then the pale beams of the electric light vanished and were replaced by a bright red glow. Then the fourth cylinder fell, a brilliant green meteor, as I learned afterwards, in Bushy Park. Before the guns on the Richmond and Kingston line of hills began, there was a fitful cannonade far away in the southwest due, I believe, to guns being fired haphazard before the black vapour could overwhelm the gunners. So, setting about it as methodically as men might smoke out a wasp's nest, the Martians spread this strange, stifling vapour over the Londonwood country. The horns of the crescent slowly moved apart, until at last they formed a line from Hanwell to Coombe and Malden. All night through their destructive tubes advanced. Never once, after the Martian at St. George's Hill was brought down, did they give the artillery the ghost of a chance against them. Wherever there was a possibility of guns being laid for them unseen, a fresh canister of the black vapour was discharged, and where the guns were openly displayed, the heat ray was brought to bear. By midnight, the blazing trees along the slopes of Richmond Park and the glare of Kingston Hill threw their light upon a network of black smoke, blotting out the whole valley of the Thames and extending as far as the eye could reach. And through this, two Martians slowly waded and turned their hissing steam jets this way and that. They were sparing of the heat ray that night, either because they had but a limited supply of material for its production, or because they did not wish to destroy the country, but only to crush and overawe the opposition they had aroused. In the latter aim, they certainly succeeded. Sunday night was the end of the organised opposition to their movements. After that, no body of men would stand against them. So hopeless was the enterprise. Even the crews of the torpedo boats and destroyers that had brought their quick firers up the Thames refused to stop, mutinied, and went down again. The only offensive operation men ventured upon after that night was the preparation of mines and pitfalls, and even in that their energies were frantic and spasmodic. One has to imagine, as well as one may, the fate of those batteries towards Escher, waiting so tensely in the twilight. Survivors there were none. One may picture the orderly expectation, the officers alert and watchful, the gunners ready, the ammunition piled to hand, the limber gunners with their horses and wagons, the groups of civilian spectators standing as near as they were permitted, the evening stillness, the ambulances and hospital tents with the burned and wounded from Weybridge, then the dull resonance of the shots the Martians fired, and the clumsy projectile whirling over the trees and houses and smashing amid the neighbouring fields. One may picture, too, the sudden shifting of the attention, the swiftly spreading coils and bellyings of that blackness, advancing headlong, towering heavenward, turning the twilight to a palpable darkness, a strange and horrible antagonist of vapour striding upon its victims, men and horses near it seen dimly, running, shrieking, falling headlong, shouts of dismay, the guns suddenly abandoned, men choking and writhing on the ground, and the swift broadening out of the opaque cone of smoke. And then night and extinction, nothing but a silent mass of impenetrable vapour hiding its dead. Before dawn the black vapour was pouring through the streets of Richmond, and the disintegrating organism of government was, with a last expiring effort, rousing the population of London to the necessity of flight. Chapter 16. The Exodus from London So you understand the roaring wave of fear that swept through the greatest city in the world just as Monday was dawning, 
the stream of flight rising swiftly to a torrent, lashing in a foaming tumult round the railway stations, banked up into a horrible struggle about the shipping in the Thames, and hurrying by every available channel northward and eastward. By ten o'clock, the police organisation, and by midday, even the railway organisations, were losing coherency, losing shape and efficiency, guttering, softening, running at last in that swift liquefaction of the social body. All the railway lines north of the Thames and the southeastern people at Cannon Street had been warned by midnight on Sunday, and trains were being filled. People were fighting savagely for standing room in the carriages, even at two o'clock. By three, people were being trampled and crushed even in Bishopsgate Street, a couple of hundred yards or more from Liverpool Street Station. Revolvers were fired, people stabbed, and the policemen who had been sent to direct the traffic, exhausted and infuriated, were breaking the heads of the people they were called out to protect. And as the day advanced and the engine drivers and stokers refused to return to London, the pressure of the flight drove the people in an ever-thickening multitude away from the stations and along the northward running roads. By midday, a Martian had been seen at Barnes, and a cloud of slowly sinking black vapour drove along the Thames and across the flats of Lambeth, cutting off all escape over the bridges in its sluggish advance. Another bank drove over Ealing and surrounded a little island of survivors on Castle Hill, alive but unable to escape. After a fruitless struggle to get aboard a northwestern train at Chalk Farm, the engines of the trains that had loaded in the goods yard there ploughed through shrieking people, and a dozen stalwart men fought to keep the crowd from crushing the driver against his furnace. My brother emerged upon the Chalk Farm Road, dodged across through a hurrying swarm of vehicles, and had the luck to be foremost in the sack of a cycle shop. The front tyre of the machine he got was punctured in dragging it through the window, but he got up and off, notwithstanding, with no further injury than a cut wrist. The steep foot of Haverstock Hill was impassable, owing to several overturned horses, and my brother struck into Belsize Road. So he got out of the fury of the panic, and skirting the Edgware Road, reached Edgware about seven, fasting and wearied, but well ahead of the crowd. Along the road, people were standing in the roadway, curious, wondering. He was passed by a number of cyclists, some horsemen, and two motor cars. A mile from Edgware, the rim of the wheel broke, and the machine became unrideable. He left it by the roadside and trudged through the village. There were shops half opened in the main street of the place, and people crowded on the pavement and in the doorways and windows, staring astonished at this extraordinary procession of fugitives that was beginning. He succeeded in getting some food at an inn. For a time he remained in Edgware, not knowing what next to do. The flying people increased in number. Many of them, like my brother, seemed inclined to loiter in the place. There was no fresh news of the invaders from Mars. At that time the road was crowded, but as yet far from congested. Most of the fugitives at that hour were mounted on cycles, but there were soon motor cars, hansom cabs, and carriages hurrying along, and the dust hung in heavy clouds along the road to St. Albans. It was perhaps a vague idea of making his way to Chelmsford, where some friends of his lived, that at last induced my brother to strike into a quiet lane running eastward. Presently he came upon a stile, and crossing it, followed a footpath northeastward. He passed near several farmhouses and some little places whose names he did not learn. He saw few fugitives until, in a grass lane towards High Barnet, he happened upon two ladies who became his fellow travellers. He came upon them just in time to save them. He heard their screams, and hurrying round the corner, saw a couple of men struggling to drag them out of the little pony chaise in which they had been driving, while a third, with difficulty, held the frightened pony's head. One of the ladies, a short woman dressed in white, was simply screaming. The other, a dark, slender figure, slashed at the man who gripped her arm with a whip she held in her disengaged hand. My brother immediately grasped the situation, shouted, and hurried towards the struggle. One of the men desisted and turned towards him, and my brother, realising from his antagonist's face that a fight was unavoidable, and being an expert boxer, 
went into him forthwith and sent him down against the wheel of the chaise. It was no time for pugilistic chivalry, and my brother laid him quiet with a kick and gripped the collar of the man who pulled at the slender lady's arm. He heard the clatter of hooves, the whip stung across his face, a third antagonist struck him between the eyes, and the man he held wrenched himself free and made off down the lane in the direction from which he had come. Partly stunned, he found himself facing the man who had held the horse's head and became aware of the chaise receding from him down the lane, swaying from side to side, and with the women in it looking back. The man before him, a burly rough, tried to close, and he stopped him with a blow in the face. Then, realizing that he was deserted, he dodged round and made off down the lane after the chaise, with the sturdy man close behind him and the fugitive, who had turned now, following remotely. Suddenly he stumbled and fell. His immediate pursuer went headlong, and he rose to his feet to find himself with a couple of antagonists again. He would have had little chance against them had not the slender lady very pluckily pulled up and returned to his help. It seems she had had a revolver all this time, but it had been under the seat when she and her companion were attacked, she fired at six yards' distance, narrowly missing my brother. The less courageous of the robbers made off, and his companion followed him, cursing his cowardice. They both stopped in sight down the lane, where the third man lay insensible. Take this, said the slender lady, and she gave my brother her revolver. Go back to the chaise, said my brother, wiping the blood from his split lip. She turned without a word. They were both panting and they went back to where the lady in white struggled to hold back the frightened pony. The robbers had evidently had enough of it. When my brother looked again, they were retreating. I'll sit here, said my brother, if I may, and he got upon the empty front seat. The lady looked over her shoulder. Give me the reins, she said, and laid the whip along the pony's side. In another moment, a bend in the road hid the three men from my brother's eyes, so, quite unexpectedly, my brother found himself panting with a cut mouth, a bruised jaw, and blood-stained knuckles, driving along an unknown lane with these two women. He learned they were the wife and the younger sister of a surgeon living at Stanmore, who had come in the small hours from a dangerous case at Pinner, and heard at some railway station on his way of the Martian advance. He had hurried home, roused the women, their servant had left them two days before, packed some provisions, put his revolver under the seat, luckily for my brother, and told them to drive on to Edgware, with the idea of getting a train there. He stopped behind to tell the neighbours. He would overtake them, he said, at about half past four in the morning, and now it was nearly nine, and they had seen nothing of him. They could not stop in Edgware because of the growing traffic through the place, and so they had come into this side lane. That was the story they told my brother in fragments when presently they stopped again, nearer to New Barnet. He promised to stay with them, at least until they could determine what to do, or until the missing man arrived, and professed to be an expert shot with the revolver, a weapon strange to him, in order to give them confidence. They made a sort of encampment by the wayside, and the pony became happy in the hedge. He told them of his own escape out of London and all that he knew of these Martians and their ways. The sun crept higher in the sky, and after a time their talk died out and gave place to an uneasy state of anticipation. Several wayfarers came along the lane, and of these my brother gathered such news as he could. Every broken answer he had deepened his impression of the great disaster that had come on humanity, deepened his persuasion of the immediate necessity for prosecuting this flight. He urged the matter upon them. We have money, said the slender woman, and hesitated. Her eyes met my brother's, and her hesitation ended. So have I, said my brother. She explained that they had as much as thirty pounds in gold, besides a five-pound note, and suggested that with that they might get upon a train at St. Albans or New Barnet. My brother thought that was hopeless, seeing the fury of the Londoners to crowd upon the trains, and broached his own idea of striking across Essex towards Harwich, and thence escaping from the country altogether. Mrs. Elphinstone, that was the name of the woman in white, 
would listen to no reasoning and kept calling upon George. But her sister-in-law was astonishingly quiet and deliberate and at last agreed to my brother's suggestion. So designing to cross the Great North Road, they went on towards Barnet, my brother leading the pony to save it as much as possible. As the sun crept up the sky, the day became excessively hot, and underfoot a thick, whitish sand grew burning and blinding, so that they travelled only very slowly. The hedges were grey with dust, and as they advanced towards Barnet, a tumultuous murmuring grew stronger. They began to meet more people. For the most part, these were staring before them, murmuring indistinct questions, jaded, haggard, unclean. One man in evening dress passed them on foot, his eyes on the ground. They heard his voice, and looking back at him, saw one hand clutched in his hair, and the other beating invisible things. His paroxysm of rage over, he went on his way without once looking back. As my brother's party went on towards the crossroads to the south of Barnet, they saw a woman approaching the road across some fields on their left, carrying a child and with two other children, and then passed a man in dirty black with a thick stick in one hand and a small portmanteau in the other. Then round the corner of the lane, from between the villas that guarded it at its confluence with the high road, came a little cart drawn by a sweating black pony and driven by a sallow youth in a bowler hat, grey with dust. There were three girls, East End factory girls, and a couple of little children crowded in the cart. This'll take us round Edgware, asked the driver, wild-eyed, white-faced. And when my brother told him it would, if he turned to the left, he whipped up at once without the formality of thanks. My brother noticed a pale grey smoke or haze rising among the houses in front of them and veiling the white façade of a terrace beyond the road that appeared between the backs of the villas. Mrs Elphinstone suddenly cried out at a number of tongues of smoky red flame leaping up above the houses in front of them against the hot blue sky. The tumultuous noise resolved itself now into the disorderly mingling of many voices, the gride of many wheels the creaking of wagons and the staccato of hooves. The lane came round sharply, not fifty yards from the crossroads. Good heavens, cried Mrs. Elphinstone. What is this you are driving us into? My brother stopped, for the main road was a boiling stream of people, a torrent of human beings rushing northward, one pressing on another. A great bank of dust, white and luminous in the blaze of the sun, made everything within twenty feet of the ground grey and indistinct, and was perpetually renewed by the hurrying feet of a dense crowd of horses and of men and women on foot, and by the wheels of vehicles of every description. Way! my brother heard voices crying. Make way! It was like riding into the smoke of a fire to approach the meeting point of the lane and road. The crowd roared like a fire, and the dust was hot and pungent. And indeed, a little way up the road, a villa was burning and sending rolling masses of black smoke across the road to add to the confusion. Two men came past them, then a dirty woman carrying a heavy bundle and weeping. A lost retriever dog, with hanging tongue, circled dubiously round them, scared and wretched, and fled at my brother's threat. So much as they could see of the road Londonward between the houses to the right was a tumultuous stream of dirty, hurrying people, pent in between the villas on either side. The black heads, the crowded forms, grew into distinctness as they rushed towards the corner, hurried past, and merged their individuality again in a receding multitude that was swallowed up at last in a cloud of dust. Go on! Go on! cried the voices. Way! Way! One man's hands pressed on the back of another. My brother stood at the pony's head. Irresistibly attracted, he advanced slowly, pace by pace, down the lane. Edgware had been a scene of confusion, Chalk Farm a riotous tumult, but this was a whole population in movement. It is hard to imagine that host. It had no character of its own. The figures poured out past the corner and receded with their backs to the group in the lane. Along the margin came those who were on foot, threatened by the wheels, stumbling in the ditches, blundering into one another. 
the carts and carriages crowded close upon one another, making little way for those swifter and more impatient vehicles that darted forward every now and then, when an opportunity showed itself of doing so, sending the people scattering against the fences and gates of the villas. Push on, was the cry. Push on, they are coming. In one cart stood a blind man in the uniform of the Salvation Army, gesticulating with his crooked fingers and bawling, Eternity, Eternity. His voice was hoarse and very loud, so that my brother could hear him long after he was lost to sight in the dust. Some of the people who crowded in the carts whipped stupidly at their horses and quarrelled with other drivers. Some sat motionless, staring at nothing with miserable eyes. Some gnawed their hands with thirst or lay prostrate in the bottoms of their conveyances. The horses' bits were covered with foam, their eyes bloodshot. There were cabs, carriages, shop carts, wagons beyond counting, a mail cart, a road cleaner's cart marked Vestry of St. Pancras, a huge timber wagon crowded with ruffs. A brewer's dray rumbled by with its two near wheels splashed with fresh blood. Clear the way! cried the voices. Clear the way! Eater nighty! Eater nighty! came echoing down the road. There were sad, haggard women tramping by, well-dressed, with children that cried and stumbled, their dainty clothes smothered in dust, their weary faces smeared with tears. With many of these came men, sometimes helpful, sometimes lowering and savage, Fighting side by side with them pushed some weary street outcast in faded black rags, wide-eyed, loud-voiced, and foul-mouthed. There were sturdy workmen thrusting their way along, wretched, unkempt men, clothed like clerks or shopmen, struggling spasmodically. A wounded soldier, my brother noticed, men dressed in the clothes of railway porters, one wretched creature in a nightshirt with a coat thrown over it. But varied as its composition was, certain things all that host had in common. There were fear and pain on their faces, and fear behind them. A tumult up the road, a quarrel for a place in a wagon, sent the whole host of them quickening their pace. Even a man so scared and broken that his knees bent under him was galvanized for a moment into renewed activity. The heat and dust had already been at work upon this multitude. Their skins were dry, their lips black and cracked. They were all thirsty, weary and footsore. And amid the various cries, one heard disputes, reproaches, groans of weariness and fatigue. The voices of most of them were hoarse and weak. Through it all ran a refrain. Way! Way! The Martians are coming! Few stopped and came aside from that flood. The lane opened slantingly into the main road with a narrow opening and had a delusive appearance of coming from the direction of London. Yet a kind of eddy of people drove into its mouth, weaklings elbowed out of the stream who for the most part rested but a moment before plunging into it again. A little way down the lane, with two friends bending over him, lay a man with a bare leg, wrapped about with bloody rags. He was a lucky man to have friends. A little old man with a grey military moustache and a filthy black frock coat limped out and sat down beside the trap, removed his boot, his sock was blood-stained, shook out a pebble and hobbled on again, and then a little girl of eight or nine, all alone, threw herself under the hedge close by my brother, weeping. I can't go on! I can't go on! My brother woke from his torpor of astonishment and lifted her up, speaking gently to her, and carried her to Miss Elphinstone. So soon as my brother touched her, she became quite still, as if frightened. Ellen! shrieked a woman in the crowd, with tears in her voice. Ellen! And the child suddenly darted away from my brother, crying, Mother! They are coming! said a man on horseback, riding past along the lane. Out of the way there! bawled a coachman, towering high, and my brother saw a closed carriage turning into the lane. The people crushed back on one another to avoid the horse. My brother pushed the pony and chaise back into the hedge, and the man drove by and stopped at the turn of the way. It was a carriage, with a pole for a pair of horses, but only one was in the traces. 
My brother saw dimly through the dust that two men lifted out something on a white stretcher and put it gently on the grass beneath the privet hedge. One of the men came running to my brother. Where is there any water? he said. He is dying fast and very thirsty. It is Lord Garrick. Lord Garrick, said my brother, the Chief Justice. The water, he said. There may be a tap, said my brother, in some of the houses. We have no water. I dare not leave my people. The man pushed against the crowd towards the gate of the corner house. Go on, said the people, thrusting at him. They are coming! Go on! Then my brother's attention was distracted by a bearded, eagle-faced man lugging a small handbag, which split even as my brother's eyes rested on it and disgorged a mass of sovereigns that seemed to break up into separate coins as it struck the ground. They rolled hither and thither among the struggling feet of men and horses. The man stopped and looked stupidly at the heap, and the shaft of a cab struck his shoulder and sent him reeling. He gave a shriek and dodged back, and a cartwheel shaved him narrowly. Way! cried the men all about him. Make way! So soon as the cab had passed, he flung himself, with both hands open, upon the heap of coins, and began thrusting handfuls in his pocket. A horse rose close upon him, and in another moment, half rising, he had been borne down under the horse's hooves. Stop! screamed my brother, and pushing a woman out of his way, tried to clutch the bit of the horse. Before he could get to it, he heard a scream under the wheels, and saw through the dust the rim passing over the poor wretch's back. The driver of the cart slashed his whip at my brother, who ran round behind the cart. The multitudinous shouting confused his ears. The man was writhing in the dust among his scattered money, unable to rise, for the wheel had broken his back, and his lower limbs lay limp and dead. My brother stood up and yelled at the next driver, and a man on a black horse came to his assistance. Get him out of the road, said he, and clutching the man's collar with his free hand, my brother lugged him sideways. But he still clutched after his money and regarded my brother fiercely, hammering at his arm with a handful of gold. Go on, go on, shouted angry voices behind. Way, way! There was a smash as the pole of a carriage crashed into the cart that the man on horseback stopped. My brother looked up, and the man with the gold twisted his head round and bit the wrist that held his collar. There was a concussion, and the black horse came staggering sideways, and the cart horse pushed beside it. A hoof missed my brother's foot by a hair's breadth. He released his grip on the fallen man and jumped back. He saw anger change to terror on the face of the poor wretch on the ground, and in a moment he was hidden, and my brother was borne backward and carried past the entrance of the lane, and had to fight hard in the torrent to recover it. He saw Miss Elphinstone covering her eyes, and a little child, with all a child's want of sympathetic imagination, staring with dilated eyes at a dusty something that lay black and still, ground and crushed under the rolling wheels. Let us go back, he shouted, and began turning the pony round. We cannot cross this. Hell, he said, and they went back a hundred yards the way they had come until the fighting crowd was hidden. As they passed the bend in the lane, my brother saw the face of the dying man in the ditch under the privet, deadly white and drawn and shining with perspiration. The two women sat silent, crouching in their seat and shivering. Then beyond the bend, my brother stopped again. Miss Elphinstone was white and pale, and her sister-in-law sat weeping, too wretched even to call upon George. My brother was horrified and perplexed. So soon as they had retreated, he realized how urgent and unavoidable it was to attempt this crossing. He turned to Miss Elphinstone, suddenly resolute. We must go that way, he said and led the pony round again. For the second time that day, this girl proved her quality. To force their way into the torrent of people, my brother plunged into the traffic and held back a cab horse while she drove the pony across its head. A wagon locked wheels for a moment and ripped a long splinter from the chaise. In another moment, they were caught and swept forward by the stream. 
My brother, with the cabman's whip marks red across his face and hands, scrambled into the chaise and took the reins from her. Point the revolver at the man behind, he said, giving it to her, if he presses us too hard. No, point it at his horse. Then he began to look out for a chance of edging to the right across the road. But once in the stream, he seemed to lose volition, to become a part of that dusty route. They swept through Chipping Barnet with the torrent. They were nearly a mile beyond the centre of the town before they had fought across to the opposite side of the way. It was din and confusion indescribable, but in and beyond the town the road forks repeatedly, and this, to some extent, relieved the stress. They struck eastward through Hadley, and there on either side of the road, and at another place farther on, they came upon a great multitude of people drinking at the stream, some fighting to come at the water. And farther on, from a lull near East Barnet, they saw two trains running slowly one after the other, without signal or order, trains swarming with people, with men even among the coals behind the engines, going northward along the Great Northern Railway. My brother supposes they must have filled outside London, for at that time the furious terror of the people had rendered the central termini impossible. Near this place they halted for the rest of the afternoon, for the violence of the day had already utterly exhausted all three of them. They began to suffer the beginnings of hunger. The night was cold, and none of them dared to sleep. And in the evening, many people came, hurrying along the road, nearby their stopping place, fleeing from unknown dangers before them, and going in the direction from which my brother had come. Chapter 17 The Thunder Child had the Martians aimed only at destruction, they might on Monday have annihilated the entire population of London as it spread itself slowly through the home counties. Not only along the road through Barnet, but also through Edgware and Waltham Abbey, and along the roads eastward to South End and Shoeburyness, and south of the Thames to Deal and Broadstairs, poured the same frantic route. If one could have hung that June morning in a balloon in the blazing blue above London, every northward and eastward road running out of the tangled maze of streets would have seemed stippled black with the streaming fugitives, each dot a human agony of terror and physical distress. I have set forth at length in the last chapter my brother's account of the road through Chipping Barnet, in order that my readers may realise how that swarming of black dots appeared to one of those concerned. Never before in the history of the world had such a mass of human beings moved and suffered together. The legendary hosts of Goths and Huns, the hugest armies Asia has ever seen, would have been but a drop in that current. And this was no disciplined march. It was a stampede, a stampede gigantic and terrible, without order and without a goal, six million people unarmed and unprovisioned, driving headlong. It was the beginning of the rout of civilization, of the massacre of mankind. No Directly below him, the balloonist would have seen the network of streets far and wide, houses, churches, squares, crescents, gardens, already derelict, spread out like a huge map and in the southward blotted. Over Ealing, Richmond, Wimbledon, it would have seemed as if some monstrous pen had flung ink upon the chart. Steadily, incessantly, each black splash grew and spread, shooting out ramifications this way and that, now banking itself against rising ground, now pouring swiftly over a crest into a newfound valley, exactly as a gout of ink would spread itself upon blotting paper. And beyond, over the blue hills that rise southward of the river, the glittering Martians went to and fro, calmly and methodically spreading their poison cloud over this patch of country, and then over that, laying it again with their steam jets when it had served its purpose, and taking possession of the conquered country. They do not seem to have aimed at extermination so much as at complete demoralization and the destruction of any opposition. They exploded any stores of powder they came upon, cut every telegraph, and wrecked the railways here and there. They were hamstringing mankind. They seemed in no hurry to extend the field of their operations and did not come beyond the central part of London all that day. 
It is possible that a very considerable number of people in London stuck to their houses through Monday morning. Certain it is that many died at home suffocated by the black smoke. Until about midday, the Pool of London was an astonishing scene. Steamboats and shipping of all sorts lay there, tempted by the enormous sums of money offered by fugitives, and it is said that many who swam out to these vessels were thrust off with boat hooks and drowned. About one o'clock in the afternoon, the thinning remnant of a cloud of the black vapour appeared between the arches of Blackfriars Bridge. At that, the pool became a scene of mad confusion, fighting and collision, and for some time a multitude of boats and barges jammed in the northern arch of the Tower Bridge, and the sailors and lightermen had to fight savagely against the people who swarmed upon them from the riverfront. People were actually clambering down the piers of the bridge from above. When, an hour later, a Martian appeared beyond the clock tower and waded down the river, nothing but wreckage floated above Limehouse. Of the falling of the fifth cylinder I have presently to tell. The sixth star fell at Wimbledon. My brother, keeping watch beside the women in the chaise in a meadow, saw the green flash of it far beyond the hills. On Tuesday, the little party, still set upon getting across the sea, made its way through the swarming country towards Colchester. The news that the Martians were now in possession of the whole of London was confirmed. They had been seen at Highgate, and even, it was said, at Neasden, but they did not come into my brother's view until the morrow. That day, the scattered multitudes began to realize the urgent need of provisions. As they grew hungry, the rights of property ceased to be regarded. Farmers were out to defend their cattle sheds, granaries and ripening root crops with arms in their hands. A number of people now, like my brother, had their faces eastward, and there were some desperate souls even going back towards London to get food. These were chiefly people from the northern suburbs, whose knowledge of the black smoke came by hearsay. He heard that about half the members of the government had gathered at Birmingham and that enormous quantities of high explosives were being prepared to be used in automatic mines across the Midland counties. He was also told that the Midland Railway Company had replaced the desertions of the first day's panic, had resumed traffic, and was running northward trains from St Albans to relieve the congestion of the home counties. There was also a placard in Chipping Ongar announcing that large stores of flour were available in the northern towns, and that within 24 hours bread would be distributed among the starving people in the neighbourhood. But this intelligence did not deter him from the plan of escape he had formed, and the three pressed eastward all day, and heard no more of the bread distribution than this promise. Nor, as a matter of fact, did anyone else hear more of it. That night fell the seventh star, falling upon Primrose Hill. It fell while Miss Elphinstone was watching, for she took that duty alternately with my brother. She saw it. On Wednesday, the three fugitives, they had passed the night in a field of unripe wheat, reached Chelmsford, and there a body of the inhabitants, calling itself the Committee of Public Supply, seized the pony as provisions, and would give nothing in exchange for it but the promise of a share in it the next day. Here there were rumours of Martians at Epping, and news of the destruction of Waltham Abbey powder mills in a vain attempt to blow up one of the invaders. People were watching for Martians here from the church towers. My brother, very luckily for him as it chanced, preferred to push on at once to the coast rather than wait for food, although all three of them were very hungry. By midday they passed through Tillingham, which, strangely enough, seemed to be quite silent and deserted, save for a few furtive plunderers hunting for food. Near Tillingham they suddenly came in sight of the sea, and the most amazing crowd of shipping of all sorts that it is possible to imagine. For after the sailors could no longer come up the Thames, they came on to the Essex coast, to Harwich and Walton and Clacton, and afterwards to Foulness and Shoebury to bring off the people. They lay in a huge sickle-shaped curve that vanished into mist at last towards the Nata. Close in shore was a multitude of fishing smacks, English, Scotch, French, Dutch and Swedish, steam launches from the Thames, yachts, electric boats, and beyond were ships of larger burden, 
a multitude of filthy colliers, trim merchantmen, cattle ships, passenger boats, petroleum tanks, ocean tramps, an old white transport even, neat white and grey liners from Southampton and Hamburg, and along the blue coast across the black water, my brother could make out dimly a dense swarm of boats chaffering with the people on the beach, a swarm which also extended up the black water almost to Malden. About a couple of miles out lay an ironclad, very low in the water, almost, to my brother's perception, like a waterlogged ship. This was the ram Thunderchild. It was the only warship in sight, but far away to the right over the smooth surface of the sea. For that day there was a dead calm, lay a serpent of black smoke to mark the next ironclads of the Channel Fleet, which hovered in an extended line, steam up and ready for action across the Thames estuary during the course of the Martian conquest, vigilant and yet powerless to prevent it. At the sight of the sea, Mrs. Elphinstone, in spite of the assurances of her sister-in-law, gave way to panic. She had never been out of England before. She would rather die than trust herself friendless in a foreign country, and so forth. She seemed, poor woman, to imagine that the French and the Martians might prove very similar. She had been growing increasingly hysterical, fearful and depressed during the two days' journeyings. Her great idea was to return to Stanmore, Things had been always well and safe at Stanmore. They would find George at Stanmore. It was with the greatest difficulty they could get her down to the beach, where presently my brother succeeded in attracting the attention of some men on a paddle steamer from the Thames. They sent a boat and drove a bargain for 36 pounds for the three. The steamer was going, these men said, to Ostend. It was about two o'clock when my brother, having paid their fares at the gangway, found himself safely aboard the steamboat with his charges. There was food aboard, albeit at exorbitant prices, and the three of them contrived to eat a meal on one of the seats forward. There were already a couple of score of passengers aboard, some of whom had expended their last money in securing a passage. But the captain lay off the black water until five in the afternoon, picking up passengers until the seated decks were even dangerously crowded. He would probably have remained longer had it not been for the sound of guns that began about that hour in the south. As if in answer, the ironclad seaward fired a small gun and hoisted a string of flags. A jet of smoke sprang out of her funnels. Some of the passengers were of opinion that this firing came from shoeburiness, until it was noticed that it was growing louder. At the same time, far away in the southeast, the masts and upper works of three ironclads rose one after the other out of the sea, beneath clouds of black smoke. But my brother's attention speedily reverted to the distant firing in the south. He fancied he saw a column of smoke rising out of the distant grey haze. The little steamer was already flapping her way eastward of the big crescent of shipping, and the low Essex coast was growing blue and hazy when a Martian appeared, small and faint in the remote distance, advancing along the muddy coast from the direction of foulness. At that, the captain on the bridge swore at the top of his voice with fear and anger at his own delay, and the paddles seemed infected with his terror. Every soul aboard stood at the bulwarks, or on the seats of the steamer, and stared at that distant shape, higher than the trees or church towers inland, and advancing with a leisurely parody of a human stride. It was the first Martian my brother had seen, and he stood, more amazed than terrified, watching this titan advancing deliberately towards the shipping, wading farther and farther into the water as the coast fell away. Then. Far away beyond the crouch came another, striding over some stunted trees, and then yet another, still farther off, wading deeply through a shiny mudflat that seemed to hang halfway up between sea and sky. They were all stalking seaward, as if to intercept the escape of the multitudinous vessels that were crowded between Falness and the Nazar. In spite of the throbbing exertions of the engines of the little paddle boat and the pouring foam that her wheels flung behind her, she receded with terrifying slowness from this ominous advance. Glancing northwestward, my brother saw the large crescent of shipping already writhing with the approaching terror. 
One ship passing behind another, another coming round from broadside to end on, steamships whistling and giving off volumes of steam, sails being let out, launches rushing hither and thither. He was so fascinated by this, and by the creeping danger away to the left, that he had no eyes for anything seaward. And then a swift movement of the steamboat, she had suddenly come round to avoid being run down, flung him headlong from the seat upon which he was standing. There was a shouting all about him, a trampling of feet, and a cheer that seemed to be answered faintly. The steamboat lurched and rolled him over upon his hands. He sprang to his feet and saw to starboard, and not a hundred yards from their heeling, pitching boat, a vast iron bulk like the blade of a plough tearing through the water, tossing it on either side in huge waves of foam that leaped towards the steamer, flinging her paddles helplessly in the air and then sucking her deck down almost to the waterline. A douche of spray blinded my brother for a moment. When his eyes were clear again, he saw the monster had passed and was rushing landward. Big iron upperworks rose out of this headlong structure, and from that twin funnels projected and spat a smoking blast shot with fire. It was the torpedo ram, Thunderchild, steaming headlong, coming to the rescue of the threatened shipping. Keeping his footing on the heaving deck by clutching the bulwarks, my brother looked past this charging leviathan at the Martians again, and he saw the three of them now close together, and standing so far out to sea that their tripod supports were almost entirely submerged. Thus sunken, and seen in remote perspective, they appeared far less formidable than the huge iron bulk in whose wake the steamer was pitching so helplessly. It would seem they were regarding this new antagonist with astonishment. To their intelligence, it may be, the giant was even such another as themselves. The Thunderchild fired no gun, but simply drove full speed towards them. It was probably her not firing that enabled her to get so near the enemy as she did. They did not know what to make of her. One shell, and they would have sent her to the bottom forthwith with the heat ray. She was steaming at such a pace that in a minute she seemed halfway between the steamboat and the Martians, a diminishing black bulk against the receding horizontal expanse of the Essex coast. Suddenly, the foremost Martian lowered his tube and discharged a canister of the black gas at the ironclad. It hit her larboard side and glanced off in an inky jet that rolled away to seaward, an unfolding torrent of black smoke from which the ironclad drove clear. To the watchers from the steamer, low in the water and with the sun in their eyes, it seemed as though she were already among the Martians. They saw the gaunt figures separating and rising out of the water as they retreated shoreward, and one of them raised the camera-like generator of the heat ray. He held it pointing obliquely downward, and a bank of steam sprang from the water at its touch. It must have driven through the iron of the ship's side like a white-hot iron rod through paper. A flicker of flame went up through the rising steam, and then the Martian reeled and staggered. In another moment, he was cut down, and a great body of water and steam shot high in the air. The guns of the Thunderchild sounded through the reek, going off one after the other, and one shot splashed the water high close by the steamer, ricocheted towards the other flying ships to the north, and smashed a smack to matchwood. But no one heeded that very much. At the sight of the Martian's collapse, the captain on the bridge yelled inarticulately, and all the crowding passengers on the steamer's stern shouted together. And then they yelled again, for surging out beyond the white tumult drove something long and black, the flames streaming from its middle parts, its ventilators and funnels spouting fire. She was alive still. The steering gear, it seems, was intact, and her engines working. She headed straight for a second Martian, and was within a hundred yards of him when the heat ray came to bear. Then, with a violent thud, a blinding flash, her decks, her funnels, leaped upward. The Martian staggered with the violence of her explosion, and in another moment, the flaming wreckage, still driving forward with the impetus of its pace, had struck him and crumpled him up like a thing of cardboard. My brother shouted involuntarily. A boiling tumult of steam hid everything again. 
two! yelled the captain. Everyone was shouting. The whole steamer from end to end rang with frantic cheering that was taken up first by one and then by all in the crowding multitude of ships and boats that was driving out to sea. The steam hung upon the water for many minutes, hiding the third Martian and the coast altogether, and all this time the boat was paddling steadily out to sea and away from the fight, and when at last the confusion cleared, the drifting bank of black vapour intervened, and nothing of the Thunder Child could be made out, nor could the third Martian be seen, but the ironclads to seaward were now quite close and standing in towards shore past the steamboat. The little vessel continued to beat its way seaward, and the ironclads receded slowly towards the coast, which was hidden still by a marbled bank of vapour, part steam, part black gas, eddying and combining in the strangest way. The fleet of refugees was scattering to the northeast. Several smacks were sailing between the ironclads and the steamboat. After a time, and before they reached the sinking cloud bank, the warships turned northward and then abruptly went about and passed into the thickening haze of evening southward. The coast grew faint, and at last indistinguishable amid the low banks of clouds that were gathering about the sinking sun. Then suddenly out of the golden haze of the sunset came the vibration of guns and a form of black shadows moving. Everyone struggled to the rail of the steamer and peered into the blinding furnace of the west, but nothing was to be distinguished clearly. A mass of smoke rose slanting and barred the face of the sun. The steamboat throbbed on its way through an interminable suspense. The sun sank into grey clouds, the sky flushed and darkened, the evening star trembled into sight. It was deep twilight when the captain cried out and pointed. My brother strained his eyes. Something rushed up into the sky out of the greyness, rushed slantingly upward and very swiftly into the luminous clearness above the clouds in the western sky. Something flat and broad and very large that swept round in a vast curve, grew smaller, sank slowly and vanished again into the grey mystery of the night. And as it flew, it rained down darkness upon the land. Hey sci-fi horror fans, that concludes War of the Worlds, Book 1. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss Book 2, The Earth Under the Martians, which will come out later this month. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. A huge shout-out goes to our official members of the channel. We appreciate you all. Craving for another classic sci-fi tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.